itinei hui i tui te karakia. Whakataka ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina ki te tonga, kia mā tara tūpai. E hi a ke ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he tihei mauri ora. Well, welcome everybody to today's Strategy and Policy Committee meeting. As usual, please let myself or the Democracy Advisor know if you intend to leave the meeting, and morning tea will be at approximately 30. We move straight into apologies. So I only have apologies for um, both Councillors Wolf and Sparrow for early departure. And late, and late arrival for the Mayor. And late arrival for the Mayor. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Fitzsimons, thank you. And so I now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. And vote. So that's carried. Um, I now call on members to declare any conflicts of interest that they may have in relation to the items on the agenda. No. Uh, confirmation of minutes. I move the motion that Strategy and Policy Committee um, approve the minutes of the Strategy and Policy Committee meetings held on the 18th and 19th of November, um, having been circulated that they be taken as read and confirmed as, ac as accurate records of those meetings. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, I now put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Those in favour? You know what to do. That's carried, and there are no items not on the agenda, and we're going to get straight into it. We're even ahead of time. That was very quick, wasn't it? Uh, so we'll now start with um, Judith Grajkowski. Um, welcome, Judith. Thank you for coming in this morning, Kia ora. Uh, so, Judith, you've got five minutes, and if you do have any time, there might be some questions. We'll just make sure your microphone's on, so just the green light. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> So I will mostly read, but I'm happy for you to interject if you feel it's worthwhile. <laughs> Introduction, who am I? Uh, my name is Judith Grakowski. I'm a former academic and business librarian, now retired, a new Wellingtonian at heart. I emigrated to Auckland in 1984, became a New Zealand citizen, and have lived near the town belt in Mount Victoria since 2010. What is my message? The residents of Wellington City deserve better. Withdraw the draft spatial plan. Start over by working with Greater Wellington on a regional development plan. That was to have proceeded and set the larger context for the thinking about the draft spatial plan for Wellington City. And heed the voice of the people. Our city deserves its historical and heritage protection befitting a world capital, now preeminent for its leadership and governance, some say the envy of the Western world. If that isn't enough, commercial imperatives underpin the worth of historic preservation. Can you guess where this statement of drivers of economic gain comes from? I'll just read. The financial impact of preservation on the city is also well documented. Preservation has increased real estate values, strengthened the city's tourism industry, and revitalized neighborhood shopping districts like Barracks Row and U Street. Looking to the future, historic preservation will become even more closely integrated with urban design, neighborhood conservation, housing, economic development, tourism, and planning strategies. Part of the comprehensive plan, I think it's the district plan, of the District of Columbia, 2016. Let me begin with a red flag. When the, new, the National Policy Statement for Urban Development was delivered to local government by the Ministry for the Environment and taken up by the writers of the Wellington City Council draft spatial plan, they seem to have forgotten Wellington is a special case. I submit Wellington is, in character, significance, and physical contexts, fundamentally different from Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga, Christchurch, or Dunedin. A spatial plan for Wellington can't require shoehorned intensification that David Chick, your urban designer, now departed, said was right for Wellington, as he said it was okay for Adelaide and Melbourne. Why 
because unlike the other big cities, Wellington wears the mantle of the nation as a whole. It's heritage from pre-colonial times to the present. It has shoreline memories, reclaimed or elevated by earthquakes. It has monumental precincts, processional routes, and the town, mel town belt mother load of green space. Unlike Auckland or the other New Zealand large cities, Wellington overflows with elements that are dense with significance. In the capital precinct, the vice-regal residence is here, government house, the legislative precinct, beehive and debating chamber. The judiciary precinct is here, including the district court, the high court, the court of appeal, the Supreme Court. The memorial precinct in Buckle Street, still unfinished, continues to unveil elements old and new with contributions from partners and allies worldwide. 100 years in the making, the international diplomatic community resides in Wellington and pays its respects. Earlier, progressive urban planning had allowed State Highway 1 to transect the memorial precinct until the Eris Tunnel corrected the scandalous desecration. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip, but I can send this to you if you're interested. <laughs> what makes Wellington worth a new spatial plan? Its submissions to the Board of Inquiry on the Basin Bridge, in its submissions to the Board of Inquiry on the Basin Bridge project, an expert wit witness, Kevin Brewer of Napuhi, noted the context of the indicative landscape. If the Cambridge Kent Terrace spaces were overwhelmed by the Basin Bridge plans, or more likely in scope, now the expectation of rows of six or eight story apartment buildings, he foresaw effects on the national context, effects on the city context. In conclusion, the Wellington City Council urban design team in 2019 drafting the spatial plan must not have paid attention to the abundant and specific urban design analysis on the Basin Precinct. In those hearing documents, much was made of the surrounding localities' contribution, Mount Cook, Mount Victoria, Newtown, Te Aro. Loss of institutional memory in five years, so it seems. And I'll finish there. Kia ora. Thank you, Judith. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and call it with us. Appreciate that. I'd li now like to welcome um, the Wellington City Council Environmental Reference Group. Um, I think Lynn's not here um, yet. Is that the case? So we've got um, George and Martin. Um, thank you. And so you've got 10 minutes, um, and I think there could likely be some questions. So if you do allow a few minutes, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, greetings to Councillor Day, um, the Deputy Mayor and Councillors. Um, we are here on behalf of the Wellington City Council Environmental Reference Group, ERG, um, to submit on the draft spatial plan. My name is Martin Payne and I share this presentation with George Hobson and uh, Lynn Cadenhead uh, gives her apologies. Um, we begin with ERG support for the aspirational goals and direction of this plan. We recognise the hard work and complexity in bringing this plan together. ERG sees this plan as a critical part of a conversation that will form the long-term future of Wellington City. The purpose of this planning process is to create a better understanding of the challenges that face our city and to engage the Wellington community in creating a vision for our collector future in this place. ERG encourages the strengthening of the spatial plan vision statement to better articulate the lived experience of sort for future Wellingtonians. ERG recognises the importance of providing for new housing within a compact city, but think, th think that this plan has not gone far enough to explicitly represent other critical matters that face the city. These include both protecting our natural environment and reintegrating green spaces into our city space, transforming our economy for zero, co zero carbon, particularly in the way that we move around the city, ensure that there is infrastructure to appropriately service the needs of the population, Without negative, without negative impacts on the environment, and planning and preparing everybody for well-signalled risks. 
For example, changing weather patterns, sea level inundation of the city, city's coastal edge, and the ever-present risk of severe earthquake. These layers need to be given explicit identity in the spatial plan. ERG also recommends that the spatial plan includes a clear set of principles to frame and guide the statutory plans, bylaws and investment decisions that will, re will realise this vision and, and outcomes of the spatial, time, sorry, spatial plan over time. As a city that is wild at heart, let us use our smarts and creativity to meet these challenges together in a way that does not leave people, nature or our special places behind. Mōre na koutou ko George Hobson toko ingoa. My name's George, I'm 17 and I'm a member of the Environmental Reference Group and it's wonderful to be here with you this morning. We believe that nature is an imperative part of our city, uh, not only because of biodiversity's intrinsic value, but, but also for the well-being of Wellingtonians and our region as a whole. And I'd like to approach this from three perspectives this morning. Firstly, the spatial plan must incorporate protection for biodiversity across the entire Wellington city area. This could look like enhancing restoration efforts throughout Wellington's green belt, uh, further supporting community conservation efforts and increasing the council's contributions to conservation in the Wellington city area alongside a suite of other approaches. As such, ERG supports the overlays currently outlined in the spatial plan and we also believe it's fundamental that the spatial plan incorporates and signals strong, very strong support for the upcoming national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity, including the sometimes contentious areas of SNAs. Secondly, our water must be protected throughout Wellington. This looks like work to restore our riverways, uh, reduce pollution, enhance freshwater ecology, and collaborate with other organisations and community groups who are working to protect water throughout the Wellington region. Uh, ERG believes that the streams in Wellington must be mapped and subsequently incorporated onto the spatial plan itself. Additionally, we submit that our marine environment must not go ignored by the spatial plan and by the council as a whole, uh, because this is an incredibly unique ecosystem that is currently under severe pressure from a multitude of factors. Thirdly, biodiversity must be brought into the city. It's not good enough to simply work on conservation efforts in the town belt. We've got to work strongly on incorporating nature into the city and into developments as they proceed. And we suggest that this should include green spaces throughout our CBD areas, which can provide green corridors for species such as kaka, tiaki to move across our city from suburb to suburb. And green spaces should also be high quality public spaces that can then be used by people to spend time in and it's scientifically proven that spending time in nature is actually incredibly beneficial for both mental and physical well-being and we suggest that adding green spaces into the CBD planning would strongly enhance the livability of Wellington City which is incredibly important given the densification and the increased population that the spatial plan submits. Um, Wellington is a city with strong character and has a connect connection to nature and the elements that few cities have been able to hold on to. Wellingtonians are out there walking, cycling, recreating, moving around the city and connecting with each other in our shared and public spaces. This is an important and I think valued part of our identity as a city and we need to nurture, that we need to nurture and protect. Awareness of the need for public spaces has been amplified by the events of this year. Quality public spaces, spaces, streetscapes, parks, reserves and public buildings have saved us from complete isolation in our homes and have made room for us to connect with appropriate social distancing, of course. Um, we may see this as an aberration but as the density of our city rises, these outdoor living rooms uh, will only become more important. The spatial plan needs to emphasise and plan for a network of quality public spaces that are scaled for humans, not cars, that are close to where we live and are safe and accessible to everyone. What we are looking for here are not generic spaces, but places that have local identity, develop areas of the city with different vibes, a sense of place 
visual, cultural, social and environmental that give us a sense of belonging, being mean of meaningful and a reason to care. We also need to think about repair, sorry, we need to be to repair and to prepare. Our infrastructure is not in good shape. It is ageing, leaking and disrupting the activity of the city. As we fix these problems and prepare capacity for growth areas, we need to be mindful of multiple outcomes. Service provision, resilience, zero carbon, protecting the environment, where it is better to retreat than to develop and how to manage water more effectively and sensitively. The spatial plan needs to be more explicit on how we achieve this. It is also an important, it will also give important direction to the district plan review. And to very briefly conclude, ERG believes that the spatial plan signals positive change for Wellington uh, to ensure that, well, the, vi the city is vibrant and sustainable for years to come, but we suggest that this plan needs to go even further in developing that vision for Wellingtonians. And as a young person, it is my generation that will be most impacted by these changes. And speaking on behalf of ERG, we want to see a future that is vibrant, that is sustainable, and that. Uh, well, is beneficial for Wellingtonians as a whole. Uh, I'd also like to conclude and mention that ERG is a resource with a range of expertise and we would welcome engagement with councillors through, uh, you're welcome to attend our meetings at any time and we'd also uh, invite you to contact our portfolio leads who've got expertise in different areas to provide advice to council matters. Thank you so much for the time and we welcome any questions. Kia ora. we've got a bit of a list but we might only have time for one, I suspect. Um, Councillor Paul. Um, kia ora, thank you for that submission, really good. Um, I was just wondering, because you touched on SNAs and we had a group of people come in to our, our roundtable session last week talking about SNAs and how difficult it is being a landowner whose mm. part of their property is um, designated as such. Um, but I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, even if you have to speak personally about um, your views on SNAs, obviously we can't take them out because they're not our control, but what value they offer and ways that we could strengthen those values as well through our own processes? Absolutely. Very briefly, I think on SNAs, it's absolutely crucial that, um, well, first off, it's crucial that we signal strong support for the MPSIB because that's an incredibly valuable tool for protecting biodiversity. Public land holds incredible, bio or private land, I apologise, holds incredibly valuable conservation uh, species and ecosystems and habitats and it's fundamental for preservation of conservation in New Zealand that we do act to protect biodiversity on both public land and private land and SNAs are a tool to do that. Mm, kia ora, that was very good timing. <laughs> well, tēnā kōrua, thank you for taking the time to come and kōrero with us in the work that you do with um, ERG, we appreciate that. Thank you for the time. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, uh, Robert Gray, um, no my Robert. Welcome, thank you. Thanks for coming in on this miserably wet morning. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so thank you, Robert. We appreciate you taking the time. And um, you've got five minutes, which does seem to go quite fast when you're trying to share off on lots of information. It is. So, particularly well, thank you. some questions at the end. Yeah. Okay, um, so good morning. My name is Robert Gray. I was born and bred in Wellington. I've been a CEO of large international and national companies and a director of three council controlled organisations. For a good part of my working career, I was heavily involved with strategic planning. Therefore, I am a forward thinking person and feel I'm well qualified to, to comment on the spatial plan. As the plan currently stands, I strongly believe that if implemented, there is a high risk of destroying Wellington's unique identity and culture, which would be lost forever. The success of any future planning is getting growth assumptions as realistic as possible. The growth assumptions in the plan can no longer be substantiated as the main basis used for calculation included historical data and the presumption that employees tend to live closer to their workplace. COVID level four lockdown has now made that thinking irrelevant. In light of COVID, companies are reviewing their business models some are closing, some downsizing, and others moving out of cities. I have examples, this is already impacting Wellington City and happy to talk about them at the end. The full extent of this impact will not be fully known for quite some time, 
but one outcome will be the vacating of some commercial buildings in the city over time. There are many advantages in decentralising businesses, including companies reducing high value property costs and staff numbers by downsizing or moving out of the city, employees able to live in areas that meet their lifestyle and budgets, and that's important. There is also an upside from a spatial planning point of view <clears throat> in converting vacated inner city commercial properties to residential. It would be totally irresponsible for the council to move forward on their current projected growth numbers as projecting numbers that are too high or too low will in both cases have major negative outcomes for Wellington. There is a risk-free way forward without delaying the process, which would be to exclude all heritage and character areas from the plan at this stage. My understanding is that utilising the growth potential for Adelaide Road, Kent and Cambridge terraces and the potential of converting commercial buildings to residential in the city will more than meet possible growth projections for the inner city without impacting on Wellington's identity and culture. If further expansion of the city is required in the future, the character and heritage areas of the city can then be re-looked at so a targeted and controlled approach, taking the COVID impact into consideration can then be taken, not the unscientific approach currently being pursued. We also oppose the removal of the pre-1930 demolition controls and prescribed height and scale of replacement buildings in the inner cities, in the inner suburbs. Having lived in Mount Vic for 18 months, a car, pa car parking on the street has become more difficult to find. We strongly oppose the erection of multi-storey buildings without on-site car parking. To do so will create major traffic issues in Mount Victoria. We totally oppose extending the current site coverage formula and proposed height levels on land that boundaries with character sub-areas. Proposed spatial plan will compromise sunlight, views, light and privacy to those existing heritage and character houses that neighbour unprotected land. So that's all I've got, so I've got a minute to go. So any questions I'll be keen to take. Kia ora, we've got a question from Deputy Mayor Free. Uh, look, thank you, um, Robert. It's interesting um, hearing what you say. I wanted to drill down a little bit into the thing that you said about um, building buildings without car parking would create major traffic issues in Mount Victoria. Yep. And I'm just interested in that connection, given that a lot of evidence shows that if you actually don't have car parks, people are actually forced to think about other modes of transport, which there is an argument that actually helps congestion, especially in an area like Mount Victoria. Yeah, I, I understand that, that people who live close to the city, a lot of people will want to walk into the city won't require a car, but uh, uh, my, my mind tells me that um, most people will want a car. They want to get out. They want to go out to Bunnings, out the hut or somewhere in the weekends. They want to do things. So and that, so, so I don't think you're going to eradicate cars. In fact, it might even put off people buying into those, those apartments if they haven't got car parks. Because at the moment, the, um, the parking is getting bad at times. And it's uh, also during the school year, it's amazing how many school children take their cars to school and park them in the likes of our street and others during that. Mm. Thank you for clarifying that. Well, kia ora. thank you, Robert. Um, we've run out of time now for more questions, but thank you for taking the time to come in. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome Mount Victoria Historical Society. I understand Joanna Newman, you're representing the society this morning. Thank you, and so um, you've got 10 minutes. Thank um, you. You're an organisation. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. And I just draw your attention to the, the, the slide because all those four pictures up there are areas which are losing their protection and could all be subject to four to six storey buildings. But I'm going to focus on heritage matters this morning even though in our submission we talked about process and we had concerns about the statistics and numbers underpinning the plan, we still have concerns about that, but I'm going to focus on heritage. 
because we essentially do not believe that the removal of heritage in protection in Mount Victoria or other areas with heritage housing stock is going to achieve the council's need for more housing. You don't need to destroy that to get sufficient housing in Wellington. There are significant areas around Tiaro, Adelaide Road, Kent Cambridge Terrace, Thorndon Quay, which could be developed first without putting at risk the heritage of Mount Victoria. And the council's own statistics show that it's already a very densely populated suburb. It's medium density and the highest out of all the suburbs in Wellington except for Mount Cook and Newtown West. And that is despite over half the area of Mount Victoria being town built, three schools and government house. So Mount Victoria's built environment has incredible value to Wellington from a heritage and a promotion, tourism promotion point of view. And that would be lost if protections removed. Of all the areas in Wellington, this is the most visible to visitors, national and international. Kiora, um, Air New Zealand's in-flight magazine, features it reasonably frequently. And one, this one had a full spread of Mount Victoria and then yet another picture of it. So in one article on Wellington, there are two pictures of Mount Victoria's housing. And the potential for further promotion is huge if we retain that heritage quality. Quite apart from the overall look, there are all the famous or well-known people who have lived there, like Bernard Freiburg, Kate Edgar, Waring Taylor. And Wellingtonians, in the feedback on the um, planning for growth, so they, they all said that it would be terrible to lose well, 200 of them said it would be terrible to lose the character and it was really important to preserve. But I'm talking about character, but I really want to emphasise that I'm talking about heritage, not character, because Mount Victoria is one of the oldest suburbs and heritage is not just about the overall look and a few gable roofs stuck on three-storey townhouses to look as though it's preserving some kind of character. It's also about the people and the history. And these buildings, which are the original ones, are living reminders of the people who have lived there, whether they were workers, labourers, small and prosperous businessmen or well-known people. And there are many stories yet to be told and it can all be visualised and brought to life walking through Mount Victoria. We also think that the application of the National Policy Statement on Urban Development is flawed. We don't think that the draft spatial plan, special character or character sub-areas meet the requirement for qualifying matters. And that designating the suburb as a heritage area would be more justifiable and sounder. We also think that the list of qualifying matters needs to be expanded to include shape and form of buildings. So even where buildings don't exhibit heritage qualities, they, if they are of a similar form and scale, they should be, have some protection. And views from the city could also be used as a qualifying matter because the integrity of Mount Victoria's built environment is critical to the maintenance of iconic views of Wellington and the town belt. I'd like to move on to some of the really problematic issues about the character sub areas. There are streets that contain important heritage, but only on one side. But because the other side has less homogeneity or authenticity, the whole street has been included from protection. And a really good example of this is Lipman Levy, where, or Lipman Street, where the east side is still really intact, even though 
the other site has been destroyed, but the whole is removed from protection. Other key areas which have been left out and that could potentially be filled with four to six storey apartments are South and Central Austin Street and the associated streets of Rickson Grove, Westbourne East, uh, Westbourne Grove, and they are little dead end streets with a lot of original housing. North Austin Street, Marsh Banks, Port and Stafford Street, Earls Terrace, and Vogel Street. That's so the bottom left photograph is Stafford Street. And just to illustrate that heritage is about more than the shape of houses, we have this little publication, The Stafford Street Story, which writes up its history since land was first settled there. And if you want to have a closer look, the mayor has a copy, so you can ask him to borrow his copy. Another one which is a major problem is Central and South Brougham Street and the intersections with the side streets. So bottom right, you have Central Brougham Street. Almost every house there is original and the one that is not was rebuilt to look exactly the same as the original. And the two either side are 1869. Off there in the middle, you have Queen Street and those two edges are not protected and they are very historic. That's Art Attack and the original Mount Vic Cafe. And then there's Ellis and Patterson Streets, which is very hard to understand when the council's own his, uh, heritage report on Mount Victoria said they were important. Which leads on to the fact that if the council chooses, it can use the legal precedent set by a high court case um, over the historic heritage of southern Mount Victoria to support its case for creating a heritage area. So the Basin Bridge Inquiry said that that southern area of Mount Victoria was a sensitive heritage precinct. The High Court case, which was won against, by the opponents against NZTA, agreed with that decision and, and concluded that that end of Mount Victoria was um, historic heritage under the RMA. So, this could be used as a qualifying matter, and surely if it applies to that southern end of Mount Victoria, it could be justifiably applied to the rest of Mount Victoria. So what Mount Victoria Historical Society would like to see is the whole of Mount Victoria designated as a heritage area. We think renewal is happening now, in appropriate places. We think it could do with some tweaking around the district plan rules, but renewal is happening. And we do think that new building within that overall heritage area of Mount Victoria should be re restricted to type one of the district plan. And I'd just like to finish by saying that I, we really endorse the idea of phasing to open to um, all comers and developers destruction of the critical Mount Victoria heritage area from the get-go is just crazy. Develop in areas which really need renewal and development and in 20 years time if you're not meeting your targets, then look again at areas which have got important heritage for Wellington. Thank you. Oh, kia ora. Um, you've put it perfectly into 10 minutes. Well <laughs> done. Um, unfortunately, that means we don't have time for questions, but thank you for sharing your whakaro, your thoughts with us. We appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to welcome Rachel McFarlane. Um, welcome, Rachel. Kia ora. Uh, so, Rachel, you've got five minutes. Thank you. And, um, we might have some questions, but uh, yeah, I don't know whether we'll have time or not. Uh, five minutes goes quite fast, just sharing your thoughts with us, and that's important. It does. So thank you. And I am singing the same song. 
I live in, in Ella Street, Mount Victoria. This is does my husband, who's talking later. And I am opposed to the construction of multi-story buildings in our area of Mount Victoria. I'm not against the construction of more affordable housing in Wellington, but such development should first take place in areas that need regeneration, when where old for office and factory buildings have passed their use-by date and need repurposing or replacing. In such areas, new multi-story apartment buildings can be blended with existing buildings of similar heights. And I think there is plenty of scope for this in Wellington. My concern is the effect that the spatial plan, if adopted as it now stands, would have on the character and livability of our suburb. I can't speak about the other character suburbs. I can only really speak about my own, but I'm sure they have the same concerns. The city planners must not repeat the mistakes of the past and allow multi-story buildings to invade the area. Ours is a heritage era, and that is what makes it so attractive. The houses are built on a human scale. They have gardens. They are not overshadowed by neighboring buildings. Consequently, the best use of sun can be made to keep them dry and warm. Since they're built on the slopes of Mount Victoria, most of them can have good views. The houses can be modified, and they can be modernized without losing their essential character. They can survive earthquakes, when not all multi-story buildings can do so. An increase in density in Mount Victoria can be and is being achieved through the infill and the repurposing of existing houses in Mount Victoria. I'm opposed to the removal by the council of the pre-1930 demolition controls in Mount Victoria and I'm opposed to the shrinking and piecemeal approach to character areas. Most of the pre-1930s houses are attractive and good to live in. The heritage nature of our suburb is what makes, gives it its character. It builds a community spirit. It preserves a connection with people who have lived there in the past. It preserves the social history of the area. There's no logic to what is included or excluded. How can the advantage to residents of the sunlight access control envelopes be maintained if consent is given for the construction of multi-storey apartment buildings that will overshadow the heritage houses next or near to them? Three-storey buildings could work, depending on the location, but not four or more storeys, and certainly not six or more. I object to the blanket treatment of Ella Street as suitable for Type 3 and Type 4B buildings. Ella Street, where we live, is already a medium density area with a lot of rental properties in high demand as they are in walkable distance to the city. Many young people and new arrivals to Wellington currently occupy the large houses that have been divided into multiple flats. Building four to six story new apartments in Mount Victoria is unlikely to provide housing that these people can afford. Ella Street is essentially a street of pre-1930 houses forming a coherent streetscape of character houses. Sorry, I'm stuttering, but <laughs> many of the houses have interesting histories worthy of being noted. It's a pity that the council does not yet have a system of plaques to acknowledge the roles played by the people and their houses in the history of the city and the development of it. The sense of identity is in danger of being lost. And then there's the proposed second Mount Victoria tunnel. The treatment of Ella Street in the special plan does not take it into account. The tunnel will have a protective buffer zone around it, underneath the ground, which affects houses in Patterson Street, Austin Terrace, and Ella Street. We were told by the NCTA engineers some time back, sorry, I can't remember exactly when, that we would not be able to build a multi-story building on our land after the, council, after the tunnel had be, has been constructed. We have no intention of doing so, of course. I am in favor of an extension of the character areas into a heritage category to uncover the suburb of Mount Victoria. 
The picturesque nature of our suburb is an asset to the city of Wellington. The historic housing stock of Mount Victoria and its unique suburban form are used to promote Wellington, as Joanne has said, not least by the City Council. Our suburb is visited by and appreciated by New Zealanders and international <coughs> tourists alike. We have people going out Ella Street to look at the um, Lord of the Rings site. Um, you've come to the end of the five minutes. Okay. So we'll All I'm going to say you. is it would be terribly sad for future generations if our lovely, sunny, character-filled suburb were to be turned into a bleak area of concrete canyons. Don't let it happen. Well, kia ora, Rachel. Thank you for taking the time to come in. Uh, I'd like to welcome from Kaiang Order, um, I think we've got Greg um, Growski and Brendan Liggett here. Um, no mai, hore mai. Thank you for coming in um, to talk to us today. So you've got, you've got 10 minutes and there likely will be some questions, so if you can leave a bit of time, that would be good. Yep. Kia ora, my name's Brendan Liggett, um, Greg Growski, our new Regional Director for Wellington and Kapiti Coast, who May of you, some of you may be familiar with, um, has just recently been appointed to that. He's incredibly sick today, so he sends Aww. his apologies. Um, so you have me. Yeah. So my role is Development Plan Manager, so I'm responsible for the planning related uh, activities of the business. So if we just... There's a green dot. So just Quickly about Kainga Ora, we're a new entity, um, just over 12 months old now. So it was to bring together uh, all of the government's delivery agencies in respect of housing and urban development. So it brought together Housing New Zealand, which is the state landlord formerly. Uh, also brought with that uh, HLC, which was a subsidiary company delivering large-scale activities in Auckland. Uh, and also the KiwiBuild program uh, that was uh, founded under the Labor government when it took office. The purpose of, the, of bringing everybody together is to create a, a single uh, focus for ha housing and urban development. So we have two key roles. One is public housing landlord. The other is the urban development uh, mandate, which is new relative to what we were doing in the past. So purpose for us and objectives is to provide people with good uh, access to high quality, uh, warm, safe, dry homes. And to do that in a way um, that provides access to services, to jobs uh, and amenities that communities need, and to integrate in that housing and the social support that comes with it into communities in a cohesive manner. So just turning briefly to the uh, Wellington Spatial Plan, the reason we're here. So Kainga Auras, we've undertaken a detailed review of what has been set out um, by Council. Generally, we're in support of the direction of travel that the Council has taken and indicated through the spatial plan. Uh, however, we have identified through our review of that that there is some refinements that could be made to better reflect the direction that the National Policy Statement Urban Development has set out, as well as the National Planning Standards. In terms of the housing response, um, we think it's getting close, but we think further intensification could be enabled spatially across the city, and we've provided extensive maps to demonstrate where we think that could happen. Um, we do question how business land has been accounted for and the evidence base that sits behind that, and we think further work beyond the CBD needs to be undertaken by the Council when it's dealing with its centres, and actually to consider going through a process of categorising the various centres that exist within Wellington as to their appropriate function first, then we can decide form that goes with it. So what are those centres trying to achieve relative to the region? What is their status sub-regionally? What are they serving locally? How do, they, how do they actually serve the communities? Then look to a form outcome beyond that. So I've just touched on the first point there around the centres, um, but we do think that once that exercise has been undertaken, um, there are some centres that we think uh, could be elevated in terms of their status across the city, which could then also mean that there is a commensurate uh, provision of additional housing intensity around those centres when that's undertaken. Turning a little bit to some of the other frameworks that Council has identified through its opportunity process, um, 
Kaingora is not solely about the brownfield and the intensification. We do support greenfield activity where it is appropriate. Uh, we also, however, seek that when that is undertaken, that is done in a planned and coordinated manner to achieve the community outcomes that those future communities will need. Master planning and other activities need to support that alongside the sequencing of those areas through the city. Infrastructure is something that everyone has to tackle when we move to the delivery space. I guess the concerns we're expressing here is that there are some gaps identified around the Three Waters provision. How that is to be delivered over the life of the 30-year spatial plan is important, and we think further evidence needs to be collected alongside decision-making that needs to follow that as to how the provision of infrastructure will sequence through the city and how it will be funded. Uh, that is one of the biggest handbrakes to delivery of any spatial uh, plan that is developed, and we think a whole lot of work needs to go into that space. As a result of that, that gives you the opportunity to deal with then the integration question of investment, particularly big infrastructure investment, alongside the land use that, that needs to come in to support that. The other aspect of it is the softer infrastructure, the social services uh, piece of the puzzle. We didn't find a lot of commentary or assessment in that space. For us, that's a little bit disappointing. Um, and we would express that we think council needs to do more work on planning for the other social services that need to come alongside and support growth. Just over five minutes, but questions. Great, kia ora. First part, our first question is from Councillor Pannett. Um, thanks so much for coming in and giving such a great submission. Um, I guess my question is, you, you've got a commitment to building in Wellington, and what capacity really is there for our two organisations to partner together to make um, more housing, particularly for vulnerable user groups, you know, like disabled people, refugees, and so on? So the mantra of our new organisation, one of the guiding principles is that we can't do it alone. We have to do it with others. So across the country we are looking for opportunities to partner with agencies like council and others to actually deliver things. Um, in terms of down in the detail, I understand there's extensive consultation happening between our organisations about the social housing delivery, both your own as well as ours. Um, this is one council where we're actually subservient in terms of scale uh, to, to you. Um, but in terms of actually meeting the network need, we have to do it together. Um, we both have substantial portfolios. How we leverage off that and how we leverage off some of the work that we do in terms of the delivery space, we're building houses every day, we're good at it, versus what you guys can do in the planning and the infrastructure and the spatial um, land use pattern, we need to do that together. Only money. <laughs> uh, not me personally, but there are extensive discussions. There are extensive discussions that occur uh, with government agencies around that. Um, Councillor Calvert. Um, thank you. Um, I, I noted that you made a number of comments about how our spatial plan could be improved by perhaps being more than just a, a, a zoning plan, essentially. Have you got any, um, can you point to us to any um, examples of uh, around the country that we could look at? The most advanced and the one that has, has done the most detail would be the Auckland example, and not to quote Auckland to Wellington, yeah. but there is a process that they've been through and they have been through it twice now, um, where it has brought in a whole lot more information than simply just the delivery uh, land use response. Uh, if you go to the original Auckland plan, map D2, was one page out of about a 90 page document. It goes through and identifies all of the community infrastructure requirements sequences out how that will occur. What the cost of that is, subsequently it also identifies what the funding gap is, but that's an important thing to know so that <coughs> organisations can actually have a, a mature conversation about what is required and how things can be funded going forward. Okay, thank you. And I've got a part I from Councillor Fitzsimons. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Um, I guess I'm just interested from your perspective, what are the major barriers to building more homes quicker? Well, one of them is what we're talking about right now, how how we deal with the inherent tensions in the system. So the infrastructure meeting the, the spatial delivery strategy um, and that sequence actually happening 
it's disjointed all over the country. We have good intention and we lay that out in our plans and our policies and then we don't follow through to implement. Mm. From council side, that's the infrastructure piece. Then from the market side, it's got to go through the extensive process to actually get a delivery outcome consented. And for them, that's certainty. So the administration that council fulfills in terms of its regulatory functions, making sure that that's operating effectively, making sure that it's actually pointing to your strategic settings when a policy like this is released today. The district plan was done 10 years ago. There's a mismatch. So you're saying it's not now? Sorry? And it needs, you're saying that, that that's not happening now? Yeah, that, yeah, that's what needs to be brought together. And um, does Kaio Order take more steps than is legally required to consult neighbours and communities when you're doing uh, new housing developments, or do you just do the sort of bare minimum of the legal requirements? So Housing New Zealand hat on, we would have worked to the framework of the Resource Management Act, which is simply to consult with communities. One of the operating principles that sits inside our new legislation is that we have to work in partnership with people, so there's quite strict legal obligations that we must meet in that space that are over and above what is required cool. by the Resource okay. Management Act. I thought so. Cool, cool. Thanks. Oh, kia ora. perfect timing there. Um, thank you so much, Brendan, for coming in and sharing your experience and your, um, your uh, you know, suggestions for us. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ben Van Den Eichel. Um, welcome, Ben. Kia ora. Thank you for coming in. So, Ben, you've got five minutes. No, yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you. So, yep, my name is Ben. I uh, grew up. I was born here in Wellington. I've grown up here. I have lived in Kandala, Miramar, the CBD, the inner cities. Uh, I currently live in Ara Valley, um, and I'm basically here because I think a lot of the spatial plan makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, in my mind, the main point of a house is to be a shelter. It's to be warm and dry. Um, I think aesthetics are nice to have. Uh, in the same way that uh, Art Deco became unfashionable after the post-war period, where there's a lot of economic struggles, I think. Um, Putting so much weight on the aesthetic, on the character of a neighbourhood now is in bad taste. Uh, I agree with the intent of the spatial plan, therefore, to be more strategic on how it balances preserving Wellington's character against um, how it's going to deal with the needs of the population today. I actually live in one of the character streets. Um, I've just bought a house there recently by Black Magic. I don't know how I did it. Um, and where I live, is I'm surrounded by the 16 bedrooms on three sides. These houses will forever be rentals. Um, just the current way that Wellington, uh, current kind of households that live in Wellington, you'll never have people needing five, six bedroom places. Um, so I really like that there's this opportunity for more houses to be replaced with these houses that are instead better suited for the current kind of households in New Zealand. Um, I know that since the 1970s, the average size of houses has got larger whilst the average household has dropped by a whole person. So I think, um, I don't want to say higher density because that's like a bad word, but Rethinking density is a really important thing. Um, I know that it's not just about the number as well, so I quite like that the houses are being built where they are. I know in Sweden, back in the 60s, they had a housing crisis, they had a housing problem there. Uh, they built a million houses, and at the time, they had about 7.5 million people. So you'd think it resolved it, but it didn't. They have a housing crisis today, and that's because a lot of these houses were built. They were the wrong kinds of houses. They were built in the wrong places. So I like that there's a lot of this um, houses focusing on in the city or in the inner suburbs. Um, I know that Australia is also, uh, they're building high rises and all that kind of stuff and they're currently discovering that they're having all these issues with it. So one thing I hope that the spatial plan considers is if you are going to have a greater focus on these kind of high rises, uh, on these sort of high buildings, on people living in more apartments, um, ways that the council is going to be able to be able to effectively regulate this. Um, you'll have blast and best line of defence against you know, shoddy houses. Um, and I know that the way the building app regulates apartments is different from how it regulates houses, uh, like, you know, a standard, like, standalone house. Um, yeah, so I think basically we're currently looking down the barrel of a housing crisis. I think it's important we use every tool we have. And so I just wanted to say that I am in favour of a lot of what the spatial plan has to say. Kia ora, we do have a question from Councillor Matthews. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, I guess um, I'm interested in your personal experience of, of how Wellington has changed for a renter over the time that you've lived here and what you've kind of seen from your kind of friends and, you know. It's so much more expensive. Um, when I first started renting here, I was living in the inner city in a nice large place. It was $165 a week, and that was considered about normal. I don't think you can get a reasonable place for under $200 anymore. Um, like I said, I'm in a house. I know that if I had 
been born a year later, I wouldn't be. I, I wouldn't have been where I am in my career. I wouldn't have had the good luck that I've needed. I have two younger siblings. They're both on much more money than I was when I was their age. And I also know that they're locked out of the housing market. Um, my family, we're not rich. We can't just sort of help them out by being guarantors or anything like that. And I know that's something that's for a lot of people. Um, um, one of the reasons I like everybody living in cities is another big change I noticed between my friends and like my parents' friends is nobody owns cars anymore. We all like live somewhere we can walk. I say no one. I have like two or three friends who own a car. Um, and I think a lot of the spatial plan by focusing on that density, by focusing on like kind of households that people can, almost like first step households, um, I think is a really good thing. Kia ora, I've got to pass away from Councillor Pennett. Thank you so much, and your points are noted. I'm just wondering, do you think there's any place for aesthetics in a city so that people are surrounded by, you know, lovely trees and, and nice buildings so that, you know, obviously meeting the basic needs first, but then a bit more? Oh, no, I absolutely think that a key part of urban planning is in the design. I know there's things like if you change to blue lights, it can, like, lower crime rates. I know there's all these tricks to use. Um, when I talk about aesthetics, I mean, like, on my street, there are these drafty, leaky colonial era houses, which are protected purely because of when they were built. They're not even, I don't think they're particularly attractive. I know one of them, when I look at it, it wouldn't be built today. It's got all these junctions, and you know it for a fact. It's incredibly leaky. Um, I think the fact that so many uh, students of Wellington are, my, my twin sister even, uh, she used to have this like, you know, coughing problem because she just lived in a mouldy house and how are you supposed to be studying at the same time as um, being just sick all the time? I, I think it's one of the things that has like a roll on effect, like you'd start to see like the ED would be less full, and things like that. Very good point, thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming in, Ben, and um, sharing your experience with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, kia ora, we've got Janet Davies who's joining us via Zoom. Kia ora, Janet. Hello. Hey. Um, so thank you, Janet. You've got five minutes, um, and if you do have a couple of minutes spare within that for questions, there may be some questions from councillors. Thank you. Thank um, I oppose the plan. I find the planning consultations flawed, and the aim of growth is unsupportable. I propose planning for sustainability and the development of eco-towns. Good practice in planning involves civil society, government and business. While council claims to have taken on board the views of Wellingtonians through a conversation started in 2017, the evidence doesn't support that. In 2017, six workshops engaged stakeholders. Who and how many were not told, except the two were for designers and developers nor are we told what questions guided discussion. In 2019, a survey of public support for four growth scenarios was posted on the council website. Online respondents were those who happened to go to the website and happened to find the survey. We're not told who they were, though web surveys are less likely to include older people, women, and people on lower incomes. The survey questions are biased, and when the responses were found to be unexpectedly negative, they were subjected to invalid manipulation. The present survey investigates support for three intensification option, options. These don't reflect the results of the previous survey. Despite the very large number of 2019 respondents opposed to tall buildings, building heights were increased. The data gathering lacks of validity and reliability and it fails to show meaningful engagement of civil society. Planning for growth is unjustifiable on a finite planet and in a time of escalating global heating and declining biodiversity. Yet a population growth of 50 to 80,000 by 2050 went unquestioned as a basis for Council's plan. Statistics New Zealand tells us this growth is entirely down to immigration. It is a choice, not a natural development. Do Wellingtonians want this level of population increase? The driver, a policy for economic growth through immigration, has failed to improve housing availability or affordability, and in the context of monetary easing, is not projected to do so in the foreseeable future. Further, this push for quantitative economic growth is contradicted by new economic models which place social inclusiveness and ecological sustainability alongside GDP. These interconnected goals underpin the five foci of New Zealand's wellbeing budget. 
Wellbeing will not be served by a plan which promotes housing for immigration over Wellingtonians' needs in a housing crisis. Though the plan has a goal of becoming greener, it's not enough to provide ecological sustainability. This needs to be at the core of the plan and integrated with Wellington's zero carbon initiative, Te Atakura. A framework for ecological sustainability assessment of all aspects of planning would include, for example, livability, improving quality of life and equality, rather than intensification, increasing building height when the mental well-being of occupants declines above three storeys. Retrofitting, allowing the full life cycle value of construction and reducing emissions, rather than replacing buildings and infrastructure. And the identification and mitigation of Wellington's climate threats. Wellington has a unique opportunity to solve its existing housing crisis with the development of eco-towns on land damaged by the use of industrial fertilizers from Lincolnshire Farm through Steppings Valley to O'Haru Valley. Biodiversity could be restored and livability achieved by the integration of eco-housing with regenerating forest and bush and the creation of parks and sanctuaries. Network walkways for pedestrians and person-powered cycles and scooters, new forms of public transport, including light rail and mobility pods, could link the new towns and deliver residents to the railway at Takapu Road with minimal carbon emissions. The town's energy needs could be provided by self-sufficient renewable power, including solar power and wind. If the council decides to go ahead with raised building heights, they must do so equally across all of Wellington's central city and inner and outer suburbs. Thank you. Um, I email you my notes and I'd be grateful if you put them up on the website. Thank you. If you email them through to the people you've been communicating with, that would be good. Thank you. And we've run out of time for questions, but thank you for taking the time to might. come and talk thank to us. Much. Thank you, Janet. All right, so now we have 15 minutes for um, morning tea, so we'll come back at 10.45. Thank you.
underway because we have a quorum and I think it's good to keep on time. So I'd like to welcome Michael Gibson um, to come and join us. Kia ora Michael, thank you for coming in. And so Michael, you've got five minutes. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, perhaps I can start with an official information request. You've just passed minutes um, saying that some oral submitters spoke to their submissions uh, at the 19th of November meeting. I'd like to know who they were. Um, as simple as that. Having, having asked that, and I, I'll, I'll table this if I may, um, perhaps I can address the elected members of the meeting and tell them not to bother with page 87 in the guff involving my name. It's a complete waste of paper and time, and you don't bother to print it, of course. I couldn't get a copy of the order paper. But at any rate, don't bother with page 87. My submission is quite simple on page 88. It reads, as you well know, I submit that no new building should be permitted if sunlight or a view is taken from an existing building. Now, if there are any questions, I'd be very pleased to answer them. Deputy Mayor Free. Um, Michael, thank you, and that's a really interesting view, but we've never had a building code like that, as you would be aware. There's always been the ability for people to build next to other buildings, and there are, have always been controls on that, but there's never been no new building should be able to build, be built if it blocks another building's sunlight or view. We've never, ever had a, um, a ruling like that. So why do you think that would be a good idea now? Because it would be totally unfair to have a rule that said anything else. So you're actually saying we should take away the controls that we have now? You know that we do have some controls, but we do allow buildings to be built, but you're saying what we've been doing in the past is unfair. I'm not talking about what you've got now. Okay. I'm talking about a rule Going forward. which you should incorporate into the new setup, whatever it is. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for, the, for that view. And of course, it's, it's up an, to It's you a pretty to radical one, but thank you. Of course, it's yep. up to you to define view and that kind of thing, but that is the principle I'm asking you to adopt. Wellington's far too precious from the point of view of having views uh, for them suddenly to be taken away from you. I've got a question from Councillor Rush. Thanks, James. Um, are you... Sorry. Michael. Michael, sorry. Oh, we're all Jill. out of order. Sorry. You're thanking Jill. <laughs> um, more to the point. Um, is this um, sunlight all day, morning, afternoon, or...? Oh, absolutely up to you to define that, but... Uh, but obviously, um, you know, sunlight, yeah, it should be uh, permitted if you, for instance, buy a property and you're happily there with your uh, perhaps having bought new sun blinds to keep the sun out, to have that, that suddenly blocked by a new building is something I'm trying to get you to incorporate as a no-no in, in the new setup. I've got a question from Councillor Condé. Kia ora, Michael. I'm just interested, um, your rule would propose that we prioritise the property rights of existing um, buildings and building owners over the property rights of, of landholders nearby um, who might not have fully developed their, their land yet. Why do you think that we should be prioritising the, the, the property rights of one group over another? I, I couldn't hear you. I wonder if you were speaking into your microphone. Sorry, Michael. Um, I was just saying that, that if we were to adopt your rule, we would be prioritising the property rights of existing residents and landowners over the, the property rights of their neighbours or those who might move into the city in future. And I was wondering why you think that we should prioritise one set of property rights over another? Um, I don't see it as a question of prioritising. I'm simply saying that no new buildings should be allowed that block the view or the sunlight of an existing building. Well, kia ora. Thank you, Michael, for coming in and um, speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ross McFarlane. No, my Ross. 
So, Ross, you've also got five minutes, and if there is time for questions, right. there may be some. Thank you very much. Some of what I'm sa I'll say um, has already been said clearly several times. However, uh, I'm Ross McFarlane. I live in Mount Victoria. I'm not opposed to appropriate scale development in Mount Victoria, as this is already occurring. I can understand how frustrating it must be for the council and its planning team to have to spend their time approving small alterations in one-off apartment development. So I can imagine their excitement when the National Policy Statement for Urban Development 2020 was issued. Whoopee! A chance to remake the city. At least, that is what the draft spatial plan suggests that they are trying to do, and it's not surprising there was no pushback against the national legislation. But to what end? And will it be a city to which the expected masses will still wish to come? Or will they choose to work remotely in other more attractive centres with only periodic visits to a mangled Wellington? I'm opposed to turning Mount Victoria into the Bronx, like that, or Sydney, like that, or even Victoria Street with the famous uh, cafe in the bottom of it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, like that. Um, there are a few points that need to be taken into account. There seems to be scant recognition of the economic benefit of the built heritage in the city. And so the protection for pre-1930 housing is to be removed. This will come back to bite Wellington in future years. Personally, I'd rather the council recognise the economic value to tourism that the inner city housing presents, in the same way that San Francisco celebrates the wonderful Victorian houses that survive today, from ornate mansions to more modest structures built for miners returning from the mountains after the gold rush. Suburbs like Thorndon, Mount Victoria, Ara Valley and Newtown are our equivalent of San Francisco's built heritage. The spatial plan in its current form could destroy much of this heritage. Within this heritage, there is still scope to do sensitive developments of up to three storeys that would not destroy the built heritage, but rather complement it when meeting the need for increased housing in Wellington. There is certainly scope for well-designed high-rise accommodation across the light commercial area between Cambridge Terrace and Willis Street and along the Adelaide Road, Ridford Street corridor, as is already happening. Retail and light commercial premises can easily be incorporated into these developments on the ground floor, as the council has decided that cars are an unnecessary requirement in Wellington and no provision is needed for parking, even for electric cars. I understand that the second Mount Victoria transport tunnel remains a possibility, and uh, we've already spoken about that today. Um, it could also be a possibility for a trackless tram route to the airport. It's therefore a surprise to note that Council's planners are unaware of the, unaware of the protection zone that will be required around the tunnel. Uh, the details have been given earlier today. Under the National Policy Statement for Urban Development 2020, Clause 3.4, bracket 3, close brackets, there is a requirement to for adequate existing infrastructure and or funding of the infrastructure to support the proposed development. As Kayanga Ora noted just before the break, the recent report for Wellington Water by Ernst Young and Becker, which recommends the expenditure of 144 million to install water meters, suggests that Wellington's infrastructure is far from development ready. Such a measure would reduce water lost through leaks by 7.2%. What, pray, would the council do about the 92.8% that would still be leaking away? And that report does not deal with the exploding sewers and the poor storm water infrastructure. So are we actually able to meet the requirements of the urban planning? There is a need for a serious rethink of the future for Wellington and the way the council is performing before the next council elections are held in 2022. Thank you very much. Oh, kia ora. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, I think in reality we've run out of time for questions because by the time the question is asked, you won't have time to answer it. But thank you for taking the time to come in and talk with us today. We appreciate you doing that. Kia ora.
Uh, now I'd like to welcome Julie Ward. No, my Julie. Thank you. And um, so you've got five minutes as well. Thank you. Good morning. Is that working? Um, I'm just going to speak on two key points which are kind of interrelated in my written submission, which is the national policy statement and its um, relation to the Johnsonville train line. Um, I've been heartened to see that the Christchurch City Councillors have unanimously expressed concerns about the MPS, with one councillor calling, encouraging residents to rise up and tell their MPs that Auckland policy has no place in Christchurch. I don't think that Auckland policy has any place in Wellington either. Um, I'm disappointed that the Wellington City Council hasn't spoken up for our city. The mandate of this council is based on social licence, and social licence is based on trust and confidence, which is hard to win and easy to lose. Your submission on the MPS showed that you understood the importance of community licence, and you said if the council was prevented from recognising local circumstances, or if rules were standardised nationally, there could be wide-ranging localised adverse effects and the erosion of licence given by the community to shape the places in which they live. I'd urge councillors to reread the submission on the NPS because many of the concerns that are being raised about the draft spatial plan are the very same matters that you raised in your submission on the NPS originally. Um, now this brings me to the at least six stories near mass rapid transit. The ministry has suggested that train stations on the commuter railway lines in Wellington are mass rapid transit. The Johnsonville line is not mass rapid transit. It does not provide frequent, quick, reliable, high capacity transport service. Um, if we look at Let's Get Wellington Moving, they talk about um, services of at least 10 minutes. Peak time trains on the Hutt Valley line run every 10 minutes, and on the Capity line from Porirua, they run every seven minutes. On the Johnsonville line, as good as it gets is every 15 minutes, and that's 50% worse than the Hutt Valley line, and it's 100% worse than the Capity line. Johnsonville trains have to struggle up a steep hill and wait to pass its sidings. They'll never be frequent enough to be mass rapid transit. The train service is really only useful to nine to five commuters to Wellington Station, and it'll never be a useful one for people trying to do daily chores, go to appointments, or visit friends in other parts of the city. The current daytime usage reflects that reality. Basically, you see trains going past with seven people on them. Um, the transport infrastructure in the area surrounding the Johnsonville line cannot properly serve 40% more people, and a plan to densify in reliance on the existence of the Johnsonville train will see the train service overwhelmed. There'll be more cars on the road, and there'll be a need for more buses competing with the same road space that there is for cars. I would like to hear my council standing by its reservations in the NPS and following the example in Christchurch and telling government that the blanket requirements of the NPS don't work for Wellington. As you submitted, in many parts of Wellington, there are matters of heritage, character, topography, hazards, and infrastructure capacity, which make it inappropriate to densify according to a standardized template. Social license requires credibility. The communities owe true and clear information and fulfillment of commitments made. I think you need to seriously reconsider whether the Johnsonville line can do what you are promising. Densifying to six stories or more near the Johnsonville train stations is not development in the right location, and it's not going to contribute to the spatial plan goals of Wellington having world-class movement systems and reducing our carbon emissions. It's going to make the transport network in the suburbs along the line worse and make getting around the city less safe, less healthy and less efficient. If you can't budge the NPS, then I suggest that you treat the suburbs along the Johnsonville line as falling into the definition of all other locations in Tier 1 urban environment under the NPS and come up for a proposal that building heights and density on urban form commensurate with the level of accessibility by public transport to a range of commercial activities and community services. Access to such activities and services by way of the Johnsonville train is really quite limited. 
Well, kia ora. Thank you, Julie. You fit a lot into that time, so thank you for coming in to share your thoughts with us. All right, now I'd like to welcome um, Tony Randall. Uh, so, Tony, you have five minutes um, today. Thank you for taking the time to come in. Thank you. So, um, I just have uh, this little, I didn't have time to put in a PDF, but I have this chart that I'd like you to have a look at, if that's right. I'll better take one to keep one in case I'm Okay. So, um, thank you, councillors, for the opportunity to address you. Um, Tony Randall, I'm a member of the Johnsonville Community Association, but also I'm here as a Johnsonville resident and a public transport advocate. Um, before we start, I just want to make one clear point about another submission that's coming a bit later on about Stride. And this is a, a, a thing I want to tell you directly from on behalf of the Johnsonville Community Association. We met last night and we passed a resolution that unanimously states that we oppose any increase in the maximum heights for Johnsonville. So just to be clear, uh, anyone who uh, says that anyone in Johnsonville wants um, increased heights, they're not certainly not speaking on behalf of the Johnsonville Community Association. Okay, um, with respect to my submission, uh, I want to, I raised a number of points, I urge you to read the whole one, um, but I want to focus on two points. First of all, um, Johnsonville Line uh, and the line into Johnsonville uh, Town Centre is a not, not a rapid transit line. Um, it's not fast and it's not frequent. It's not fast um, because the journey times are the slowest to most parts of the city of anywhere in the city. Okay, Tawa, people, the residents of Tawa get into town faster than the residents of Johnsonville. Okay, we're furthest in time travel from anywhere, from the CBD and from most other places because public transport doesn't go north or to the Hutt Valley. It's also not frequent. We have it under 15 minutes at peak, but every 30 minutes, uh, most of the time. 30 minutes, surely 30 minutes is not a frequent service. So, sh so under that definition. Uh, in fact, even your own uh, chief transport advisor says that for, for service to be rapid transit, it needs to be at least 15 minutes. And Johnsonville Line is only 30 minutes. This is shown in the evidence. The evidence is um, clear that the people around Johnsonville actually take the bus to work. And when a bus service on congestion roads is more popular than the train service, that's surely an indication that you don't have a rapid transit service that's available and attractive. Uh, lastly, uh, we, uh, we've, we've asked for information from the, from the City Council and uh, on what is rapid transit, and you have still not provided it all. It's sitting for sign off on the chief executive's desk. So I'd ask you to ask the chief executive, could you please sign out the correspondence between the city council and the government agencies on this rep what is rapid transit? Because we're at the end of submissions and we're uninformed, which is really appalling. Um, the second thing is address this graph. Um, this graph shows you it compares what is the current plan. This is your urban housing plan for 2014. This is your urban development strategy. This is actually in force in theory right now. And this urban development strategy uh, had plans for who was going to get which growth. And you can see that on the chart in yellow. 44% to the central city, 10% for Wellington East, 15% for Wellington South, 10% for Wellington West, and 21% for Wellington North. This spatial plan has dramatically reduced the percentage of share that's to go to Wellington Central, Wellington East, Wellington South, and mainly la landed it all into Wellington North. This is, this is really unfair, totally unfair. You want the city to grow, the city, all parts of the city need to take their share. Also, by transferring another 10,000 people into Wellington North, changes the profile of where you need to invest. And that includes in rapid transit. Because I have to say, let's get Wellington Move-In's justification for light rail is based on these projections for population growth. 
We have 10,000 more people under this plan, and it's North Wellington that needs a rapid transit investment, not Wellington South and Wellington East. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, thank you, Tony. I think, unfortunately, by the time we ask the question, it won't be able to be answered. But thank you for taking the time to come in. And I know that know that someone else was also on, in the line. I think what we'll do is um, people know how to get in contact with Tony to ask him any questions that they need. You are very easy to contact, so thank you. Kia ora. Uh, right, so I'd like to welcome Alison um, and Coenrad Kuipa. Welcome to you both. Kia ora. Kia ora. So you've got five minutes, and as you can see, it does go quite fast. It's hard to fit time for questions. Yeah, um, thank you. What we have to say is um, in part influenced by spending six years in inner west Sydney and seeing what has happened there. Um, Ten bullet points, um, 30 seconds each. Mm -hmm. A city which is desirable to live in has enough dwellings for those who wish to live in it. Two, a desirable city has the qualities which the plan articulates. These two desiderata may be incompatible. The question is whether rezoning which the plan proposes creates a desirable city to live in. Altering the city's inner zoning inevitably alters the cityscape, its visual identity. Wellington will slowly come to look like many other cities, for example, Sydney's inner west. Since you can't go there, I'm, yeah. <laughs> Gray, creating greater housing density accommodates more people in smaller and in all probability less desirable dwellings. High-rise and mid-rise apartments usually attract fewer owner-occupiers and more renters. It drives families and older people out of the inner city. High-rise and mid-rise apartments reduce natural light in apartments, making them less livable. They also create dark wind tunnels at street level, making them less attractive for pedestrians. High-rise and mid-rise apartments do not create affordable housing, since new housing is sold at a cost plus basis, rezoning benefits mainly developers who largely determine the final look and feel of the areas they develop. Developers are not a charity, they do not build affordable housing. That's it. <laughs> thank there could be more, but there isn't. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was very efficient. Uh, are there any parts I? Uh -huh. Councillor Rush. Um, thanks very much for coming. I just want to um, go over that last point. You are saying that new builds are generally sold uh, on a cost-plus basis, mm -hmm. but the... Yeah, OK, so... Sorry, that, that kind of dovetails with something that uh, the Chamber of Commerce had said to us as well, so thank you. Uh, Councillor Pennant. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Do you think um, design controls can meet some of those challenges that you've raised? Mm. I think... Design controls are extremely important, um, particularly in terms of um, uh, of, of sunlight. Um, I, I agree with um, Mike, uh, Michael Gibson that um, views are desirable, but I think that sunlight is extremely important. And um, what we noticed in living in Sydney was that as high buildings went up, and I think mid-rise isn't as bad as high-rise, but the wind tunnels, um, we lived in an area where the wind, um, and it, it's Sydney, not Wellington, but the wind, we noticed a, an increase. What was, I'm walking to the railway station where we were, um, it had been pleasant. It suddenly became dark because of the shadows. There was not as much, and there was, it was windier. And I would not want people to feel that, wind, that Wellington was less desirable to live in um, because of the building. So I hope that design controls could take that in, into account. Stepping the buildings back, providing, um, making, looking really hard at what happens in terms of wind tunnels is inc incredibly important. 
Thank you. We've got a pass high from Councillor Conde. Kia ora, thank you. I was just reading on Twitter this morning that inner city rents in Sydney have fallen 25% mm. um, because of the extensive building of the kind of that you're talking about in West mm. Sydney that's happened over the last little while. So I guess we're having young people coming in and saying rents are really, really expensive and their priority is to get a roof over their heads. And while they value amenities like sunlight, at the moment their priority in the housing crisis is to just have a house they can afford to live in. And I guess I would be curious to see how you think that we should be balancing those things up in Wellington. Mm. Yeah, well, Vic Victorian row houses um, provided housing, but uh, they were highly undesirable. They allowed people to live somewhere. But the point is, um, my third point about the incompatibility between, yes, we need places for people to live, um, and, you know, if we make places for people to live, but they're not very desirable, they'll still go and live there. Mm. I'm very aware um, of the number of people of um, uh, retirement age um, who are wanting to move out of their houses and into the central city um, and are having difficulty finding apartments which aren't noisy and which um, are convenient. And if they succeed in doing that, then their houses in Karori, their houses in, um, in Northland, um, their houses in, in Tawa um, become available to families. Um, and um, that is um, a, where you would hope that we're, we're in fact some of the quality building um, could help. Young people um, are the most mobile. Um, and while some of them like to live in, while it's often desirable to live in this in the central city while you're while you're younger, um, they are also um, you also have to create create a cater for a mix. Thank you very much, um, so Tina Korua. Thank you both for coming yep. in to speak to us. We appreciate that. Where does the piece of paper go? <laughs> oh, if you want to give it to um, Democracy Services, if you hand it to. Thank you, Councillor Rush. All right, uh, now I'd like to welcome from Mount Cook Mobilise, Dave Smith and Peter Cook. Kia ora kōrua. Um, so you've got 10 minutes, um, and I imagine there will be some questions, so if you allow a bit of time, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go first. Peter will follow um, Mount Cook, as you probably know. It's one of the inner city suburbs, it's high density, one of the fastest growing outside the CBD, um, slightly under 7,000 people, I think, at the last census. Um, we do not agree with the proposal to reduce character protection in about half of Mount Cook. Um, we estimated that the figures for population growth as set out originally, can be sustained without removing that character protection. We worked through uh, the um, details and the capacity assessments that underpinned the, so, the spatial plan, and we estimate that Mount Cook would need to provide about seven new dwelling units each year over and above what would be built anyway. And we think that with some smart, intelligent th thinking about incentives and ways to do infill, to do alterations, renovations, that can be provided basically from the existing housing stock. Secondly, there's significant downsides in the proposal. Uh, for the areas where full character protection would be removed in Mount Cook, that would then allow three or four storey buildings to go up. That'll reduce sunlight for the adjacent houses, it'll increase dampness, they'll become less healthy. The new places will be more expensive than the ones that they replace. The um, loss of private open space around the existing houses will be considerable because the new places will have a bigger footprint on the site than the existing ones. There's significant emission loss as a result of demolishing old timber houses with embedded carbon and replacing it with new construction with materials that have considerable emissions. Overall, we think there are a lot of downsides to the proposal as it stands at the moment. It would also look awful, frankly. We would have pepper-potted tower blocks with old houses in between them. 
The other main point that we wanted to make was that the there's not enough clarity about transition zones between the higher buildings in the CBD and the immediate contiguous areas in the inner city suburbs. The um, two areas for Mount Cook that are critical in this is the area south of Webb Street and the area which is an interface between the Adelaide Road precinct and particularly Myrtle Crescent on the lower part of Mount Cook on the eastern side there. Um, at the moment, the spatial plan proposals had a, a rapid transition from six plus, <coughs> six plus stories in the CBD and also in parts of the area south of Webb Street down to areas that have full character protection right beside them. And we would urge that before the district plan process starts, there's discussions with the community about how to manage these transition zones. They need to step down gradually. They need to um, be partly in the CBD as well as in the contiguous inner, su inner suburbs. And we need to look much more closely at that. Um, there are, if, if the plan as it stands goes ahead with a reduction in the level of character protection in about half of Mount Cook compared with what it is now, there are some very specific areas that need to be looked at again because they're, they're little gems. Um, places like Myrtle Crescent, the top of Nairn and Thompson Streets, Hargreaves Street, the north or west side, of, depending where you are, in Rolleston Street, there'll be others. All of these are outside the proposal for maintaining the character protection. And there needs to be some process to say, let's get together and sort out where are the bits that really need to be kept with full character protection. Um, the final point I'd like to make and this is probably more of a personal point, it's about the spatial plan and the process generally. It, it seems to me that the spatial plan has morphed into something which is going to apparently, people think, will solve Wellington's housing problems. It won't, it can't. Um, and it's, a, I think, a pity that it's raised expectations in that way. Um, the, the number of new builds that will happen across Wellington outside the CBD is just not going to sustain the increases in affordable housing that the spatial plan envisaged as being necessary. Um, properties just don't turn over that fast. You have to amalgamate sites where there's two small sites to get a decent sized building put on them. Um, the, there's a lot of other things that need to be done to solve the, the housing affordability issue in Wellington, both availability and affordability. And I could talk about that forever probably, but um, out of time. There's, there's not time. Um, the, the other point about the spatial plan is that it's very one dimensional. It's almost like it's been made in a vacuum. It's sort of population and housing. And what didn't come through was what are the influences that are going to affect the number of people who come? What are the future employment patterns, the work habits that people will have? Will they work from home more? Um, will businesses and organisations decentralise away from the CBD or not? Um, what about the future of transport in Wellington? What about the waters infrastructure? Can that sustain the growth that's expected? Uh, what about regional development? What about climate change? What about earthquake risk management? How are all these things going to impact on where people live, how many people come, and what's going to be required? And if they'd been taken into account, I think we would be much happier about the basis for the spatial plan and the proposed changes to the district plan. Thank Let's you. Move on to Heritage. Uh, uh, Kia ora, Council. Thanks for the opportunity. <clears throat> Obviously, heritage in Mount Cook is a very big subject. We've had uh, many heritage stories there, and I'm talking about stories IES, not houses with stories EYS. It's the stories of the people. 
you know, Mount Cook. The Burns Philp trading empire was concocted in Mount Cook. Uh, Frederick de Jersey Clear lived there, the architect, major gas company. Hell, even John Campbell lived in Mount Cook. Uh, I give you one example of the heritage buildings on Rollison Street on the on the western side. There's a long line of little workers' cottages, a dozen of them or so, currently in the pre-1930s protection, but uh, would come out of it under your proposals. There was a man who lived there at 44 Rolleston Street. His name was Billy Paris. He was a boxer. He moved in in the 1920s. He was only taken out in the 1980s when they sent him to Porarua. Uh, but as a boxer, he fought on, he, he, he was also a Seventh-day Adventist, so he was not allowed to box on Saturdays. So his entire life was one of frustration and, and struggle. He became a national champion in the 30s and 40s. The point, though, is Billy Paris has no memorial anywhere else. His house is his memorial. His story attached to 44 Rollison Street is his, his legacy. So, you know, you remove heritage protection, you're removing those sorts of stories from... Uh, you know, the, the city, and the city needs lots of its heritage stories. I also want to berate council, and although this is also partly caused by the national policy statement, for allowing the debate about heritage to be butted up against that for uh, affordable housing, for social housing. Uh, you know, Mount Cook has been very supportive of all of the social housing and has two major developments of social housing. It's very Trumpian to have put these two groups of people against each other. And I think it's not a good, not a good look at all. So I would like council, as Dave uh, Smythe has mentioned, to uh, take out its proposal to remove pre-1930s heritage protection for the inner city, where it, in the six suburbs where it uh, exists, and you know keep those stories alive. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have a quick question from Councillor Fitzsimons. Yeah, um, I'm just picking up on what you've said, because you've, you've described these as workers' cottages and then told the story of Billy Paris, yep. who's this boxer um, and lived a life of frustration and struggle, and then also saying that heritage shouldn't be buffered up against affordable housing. Where are the workers of today meant to live? Where are the people who work in our hospital, who are our cleaners and orderlies and these service workers that were so essential during COVID? Because... I, I understand councillors... Where are they going to live? Like, they're, they're not affording those workers' well, no, cottages, you are they? Uh, I understand councillors building uh, subsidised uh, accommodation for essential workers uh, on Willow Street, this is I understand. I think workers need subsidisation to live in a city like this. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think that that's a primary part of the solution, whether mm. central government or local government, that's ultimately the solution to the affordability and availability problem. It's, it's not subsidised, but maybe it should be. Okay. Uh, kia ora, tēnā koroa. Thank you for taking the time to come in today. And now I'd like to welcome James Coyle. Kia ora, James. So James, you've got five minutes. Thank you. It goes very fast. <laughs> yeah. How do I keep it short? Kia ora. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I've got a document in front of you, which feel free to take away some recommendations on the top. But I guess the main point is that 66%, um, uh, as I read it, has been zoned into Type 4B in Newtown. And I'll just be concentrating on, on uh, Newtown today. And <clears throat> I think that's kind of a do maximum approach. And I think to, to gain agreement, you need to have options. Um, so I would recommend a more of a do intermediate approach, uh, which rezones 25% of Newtown land to type 4B. So I've gone down a little rabbit hole, um, but just before I go there, I think the NPSUD is a, um, a great document. It's a landmark document, and I believe in what it's saying, tackling climate change, tackling housing affordability. Um, I also think that um, I agree with more development in Newtown, and I'd love to see it happen. I'd love to see more people, and I'm not questioning the numbers. But so we've got 700 dwellings. So I've looked at some recent projects. In Table 1, you've got the Adelaide Road co-housing, the Constable Street development, and a Regent Street development, which is close to my place on Owen Street. And I've looked at if you achieved the 700 by just doing those developments, how many hectares it would take. So that's on the right. So, for example, three hectares for the Adelaide co-housing development. I've then um, I've read the NPS, and it's, it's obviously that around a 15% uptake on development. So you kind of have to, to achieve 15% um, building, you have to make 100% of um, 
that land available to achieve the 15% if that makes sense. So I've looked at Newtown property area in table two and the building area is around 80 hectares. So if we did it all with dwelling similar to Constable Street in row three there, you would need 11 hectares. But I'd prefer we went for something like the Adelaide Road co-housing, where it's quite a quality house, it's good design. Um, there's a mixture of, uh, of apartments, so you would need 20 hectares to develop that much, which is 25% of Newtown um, developed area. So you can see well under the 66% uh, being proposed. Uh, a more likely scenario pops uh, perhaps as dwellings of various sizes, so I've popped that in there as well. So if we go down to the options, um, a do minimum of say 15% zone change in Newtown, I don't think it's going to achieve the, the growth projections. Um, it won't encourage new resident and we're likely to get investment in infrastructure, which I think would also be good in Newtown. But around 25%, I think, achieves the growth that um, the, the 700 dwellings that is in front of us. And we can start to maintain a well-functioning urban environment, which is the purpose of the NPSUD. Uh, I think beyond that, um, the risks start to come in that the infrastructure spend doesn't uh, correspond to the amount of housing available and you start to get adverse impacts on a well-functioning urban environment, which I think people are talking about a lot, so I'm not keen to go into that. I think they're well known. And then the current 66%, which I've sort of said is a do maximum WCC, I think is far and above growth projections, but I'm not saying that's not where Newtown should end up in 2060, 2080. So right at the end, I've looked at sort of a phased approach of where you might look at 25%, 2040, 40%, 2060, 66% in 2018. Yeah, and um, that's the paper. Oh, great, thank you. We've got a partai from Deputy Mayor Free. Hey, I grew up in Newtown. It hasn't changed much for years, but yes. um, if it does change and becomes more intense, what must we make sure, it, whether it's your 25% or the 40% or whatever, what must we make sure we keep? Um, and, yeah, I'm interested in your views. Yeah, well, I'd point back to the recommendations um, where I would resume, rezone Newtown Commercial Centre to Type B housing, you know, as soon as possible. Um, and then I would engage with the community to find where that 7% should go now and where, uh, you know, 25% can go in the future and then 25% can go in the future and that. And I think I'm, I'm not keen to mix up housing paradigms. I'm sure lots of people have talked about that. Um, I think there's real risks around that. So I think you, you need to start looking at um, transitioning blocks into terrace style housing. Um, so, and that's a, you know, that's a whole nother thing and needs engagement with the council. Can I ask a bit just briefly about yeah. community spaces and green space? Yeah. Oh no? uh, yeah, okay, yeah. sweet. Very quickly, I think. Um, in my submission, I wrote about that. I okay. thought um, it was poor. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, kia ora James, thank you for thank coming you. and sharing your expertise. With Appreciate that. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Stride Investment Management Limited. I know we've got Bianca here and you've brought some other people. You're all welcome to come up and join us. Thank you. Uh, so you've got 10 minutes and there will likely be questions. So if you do want to leave a bit of time, that would be good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, my name's Mark Luca. I'm the GM development from um, Stride. Uh, I've got Jared Thompson with me, who's the project director for uh, Johnsonville. Of course, we've got Bianca Tree from Minter Allison and Graham McIndoe from McIndoe Urban, who is no stranger to many of you, I'm sure. Um, I will be very brief. I just wanted to make a, uh, an introductory statement of some kind as to who we are and why what we do. So we are long-term investors. We are not developers per se. Oftentimes, we can't um, buy what we want to buy, so we develop. Um, Johnsonville has obviously um, been on the cards for many years and in the two or three years Jared and I have been at um, Stride, we've been working on that asset. It's had uh, a lot of twists and turns and not the least of which is our current climate. Um, but 
I think it's important for us to state that one, we support the plan wholeheartedly. We think it's a good plan, it's a logical plan. It reflects urbanisation of our cities and the need for density. It's just about the quality of, of, of space that emerges from that. We are seeking um, intensification and greater scale at Johnsonville. Um, one of the reasons we are seeking that is because scale improves viability, but it also um, enhances our ability to provide amenity. So by that I mean if you think about Johnsonville, it lacks a town square, it lacks a green space, it lacks interconnect in connections into the public transport. So scale enables us to afford to do things like that on our site that we won't be able to do elsewhere. It's not all about amenity. We do have a commercial motivation, obviously, but scale is really important in solving those sorts of problems or issues. Um, uh, that's probably um, all I had in mind to say. Um, Jared and I are more focused on questions if you have any for us at the end, but I hand over to Bianca. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I've just got two points that I want to make, um, and then I'll pass on to Graham. Um, so the first is in relation to the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, um, and I expect that you've all read that in detail. Um, and I think the key thing is, is that um, it has really heralded a significant change um, in planning and urban planning and how we need to provide for our urban spaces. It is planning for the future um, and it is very directive in terms of what is required. Um, and in particular, um, I was just going to highlight objective four, um, which talks about our urban environments um, and how they need to develop and change over time in response to the, the diverse and changing needs of people, communities and future generations. Um, policy 3B um, also relates to metropolitan centres and requiring those centres to um, provide for the demand for housing and business use. So these centres are not just shopping centres. Um, and they can't just be shopping centres in the future. They also, also need to provide for housing and office activities. Um, and then policy 3C, in terms of around our metropolitan centres, it's very directive to say that you have to provide for development of at least six storeys. Um, and finally, just uh, um, policy 6, um, just rec I just want to highlight and recognise um, the point they make about amenity values. Um, you know, you, you, you will hear um, from people who are concerned about intensification, um, but this really puts, kind of flips it on its head a little bit, um, that amenity values appreciated by some people um, may change over time, um, but the, the end result um, in terms of the built form will be appreciated by other people, communities and future generations. And that includes by providing increased and varied housing density and types. So in short, you know, in intensification and increased height is not a bad thing. And actually it's something that um, the, the city has to do to provide for, for the future and for the future generations. My second point is just in relation to uh, Johnsonville as a metropolitan centre. Um, now, Johnsonville is clearly a sub-regional centre. Um, it's recognised as a sub-regional centre in um, the Wellington Regional Policy Statement. Um, it's also identified in the draft spatial plan um, as a large sub-regional centre. Um, it serves a number of adjacent suburbs and is the third largest employment area even now outside of Wellington City Centre. So under the national planning standards, the term sub-regional centre has just now been changed to metropolitan centre. Um, so rather than referring to sub-regional centre, we now refer to metropolitan centres. Um, so it's really important in the spatial plan um, that you're consistent in that terminology and recognise Johnsonville as a metropolitan centre. Um, I'll now pass to Graham. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, councillors. Um, I'll be very quick. I've got two points to, to, to make. Um, the first is that um, Johnsonville is, a, is in single ownership, uh, the, the, the large central part, and that, that gives a, a rare opportunity for comprehensive uh, coordinated development um, of, of the centre. Um, now, well-planned comprehensive development offers many benefits, um, and uh, one of them is um, you can maximise development intensity while avoiding adverse amenity effects. You know, you plan all of these things. 
Um, and the second thing is obviously as part of that you can provide public access to a high quality public realm. There are all sorts of other benefits as, as well. Um, the second point um, is, and this is about building height, is allowing taller buildings at the Johnsonville Centre would offer multiple benefits. And there, are, there's, um, uh, there is quite a lot of evidence for the benefits of tall buildings in a centre, um, such as this, uh, a metro centre. Um, um, and the consequence of that would be, you know, saving on land, infrastructure, energy, and time spent travelling as you concentrate people at a centre. Um, you're facilitating walking and cycling when, when people are actually at the centre, particularly close to a um, uh, train station uh, such as we have here. Um, the 24-7 occupation with, um, that will be facilitated by a mix of uses, including residential and, and, and workspaces, will increase personal safety. Um, and then, of course, you get the increase in the viability of individual um, shops and, 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 and facilities because there are more people around to use them. Um, now, looking at specifically at Johnsonville, by enabling the development of tall buildings there, um, this is in the context of the spatial plan uh, suggesting eight storeys. Um, and I think eight storeys is, uh, is too low as a starting point. Um, um, gr greater permitted height would also would differentiate the, cent the Johnsonville centre from the lower areas around, which are six storeys. Um, and that would thereby help with a, a more varied skyline and, and that could contribute to a memorable sense of place. You know, you have a sense of there being something at Johnsonville that, that, that has a presence uh, as opposed to being perhaps a bit more self-effacing. Um, the um, Having tall buildings would provide enhanced master planning opportunities and, and give greater design flexibility to get a really, really good uh, town centre outcome. Um, now, the draft spatial plans proposed eight-storey limit precludes those benefits. Um, um, so I think note, noting the requirement um, in the NPS uh, urban development to have at least six storeys around the centre, a starting point for investigation uh, for a permitted maximum height of the centre might be approximately 12 storeys. Um, you'd need to look at it in, in more detail, but, but that would be a starting point. Um, finally, I'm confident that the amenity effects of, of uh, around the zone um, at the, height, the zone interface could be addressed with appropriate controls in the district plan, and of course those sorts of techniques uh, are used all the time and that might include stepping or high precision planes. Thank you. Okay, well, we do have a few parts. I um, will start with Councillor Calvert. Thank you. Um, yes, I've got two questions. First up is um, the council is looking at bringing the business community in Johnsville together, looking at a, um, some form of business um, group um, to look at the area. Would Stride be willing to be part of that? I, I don't see why not. We've okay. met with groups in the past. Thank you. Mind. Yeah, look, and look, I've lived in Adelaide Johnsonville for 20 years, so I've seen the, the mall. I've seen it deteriorate. I've seen Can you make your question quite quick? It. Yep, I will. Other people in so about the I, I want to understand, is your proposal based on maximising your profits so you can continue to land bank? and to the detriment of the local community. Because it's not that's about the spatial plan. Well, it is, because this is the proposals. You're proposing, you're proposing us to go even higher with those, um, with height levels. We haven't seen any development. COVID's only just happened this year. You've owned it for quite a number of years. I'm asking you, are you doing this to maximize your profits for la uh, from a land banking perspective? Um. For, uh, there's a number of questions in there. I'll try and ad address them as best I can. So in terms of land banking, land banking is not a great strategy for a business like ours, as I think I said at the outset. We are long-term owners, so that means we're investors. The only reason we have vacant land that doesn't yield any income is because we're about to do something. Um, and if you look at the balance of our portfolio, I don't think we have any other site quite like this. Um, I mean, yesterday we announced the acquisition of Deloitte um, on Custom House Key here. It's a high quality um, investment. It's a, an income um, driven decision um, and we are long term owners. So the best way to do uh, that sort of model is to actually do something. So I don't think um, the land banking thing is really something we we even identify with, let alone would go out and, and pursue. So certainly from a commercial point of view, shareholders just wouldn't tolerate that because there'd be no income. So what investment have you actually done in we 20 years? We just share years? the questions around, you can... But I just want to understand that. Um, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Um, I can answer that question. Yeah. Um, Jared, starting this week, is um, refurbishing 22 The Terrace. 
10 level office building here in Wellington. I'm talking about Johnsonville. Uh, I'm in it's in good time. Um, I've got a question for you, which is about integrated planning. So, if you do this development well, um, for, and you know, it will improve the, I guess, the lives of people that live in Johnsonville. Um, integrated planning is a really important part of it because you've mentioned in your submission about the public transport and the opportunities to improve that. Mm. Um, is that sort of a plan to be able to work with? And I guess the spatial plan helps you to see how that will fit together. A absolutely, um, and I don't want to talk about our past, but um, both Jared and I come from a group called Kiwi Property. Um, we're both instrumental in the Sylvia Park development there, um, integrated train, train station, integrated bus station, office buildings, dining, cinemas, all of those things we've spent our careers building for investors, not for developers. So this is what we, what we live to do. And so I guess we can hopefully help connect with Kiwi Rail, so that because I know that it's a challenge yeah. to try and work out yeah. how to integrate that, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Um, Councillor Condi. Kia ora. I think, um, you know, we can all see the great opportunity of that land. I think that's why you feel the frustration from the community is, yeah. is that sense of opportunity. Um, that said, I think in some one of your part of your submission, you, you actually talk about 18 stories, and I think there was quite a strong reaction to that. 18 felt like a lot. Um, so I guess my question is why 18? I'd like to hear kind of back from you. And then my follow-up question is about the, the public space you were talking about, going higher gives you more public realm. And I think, from my point of view, it would be what guarantee are we going to have if we change the spatial plan to allow you a whole bunch of hype that we're actually going to see those beneficial outcomes yeah, for our community yeah. in terms of greater public space? Well, we still have to go through a resource consenting process. So that means those plans, really precise plans, have to be lodged with council for consent. And I would have thought that those plans would reveal public space, the connectedness, the integrated planning aspects. Um, the point about height, height is sort of coincidentally, and I think um, Graham made the point a few minutes ago, um, height is about appropriateness of both function and form, and by that I mean um, a building, the right size for a building might be five levels, the right size for another building might be 22. So the metropolitan centre zoning happens to have a 72 metre um, height limitation across places like Auckland, um, if you adopt the national planning standard, which we're obliged to do, um, that would flow over perhaps in a metropolitan centre setting. But the, the last office building Jared and I did um, at Sylvia Park, it's got a 72 metre height limit, but the building's 11 storeys. So it's about the appropriateness of the actual development as opposed to slavishly you know, banging up 18 levels of building, which may well not be appropriate or commercially viable. Um, and I'll just add to that in terms of then providing height in the spatial plan. Um, I suppose the, the council um, has recognised in certain areas in terms of how they provide that, that they can they, they say at least so many stories. Um, and so, um, you know, I suppose we've got support from Graham that, you know, if we looking at a stepping up from height from the surrounding residential area, then a doubling in height is kind of appropriate. So wherever the council lands in terms of that height around the area, you know, then it's providing at least a doubling, you know, or, or more, you know, it can provide for that flexibility. Um, and then guidance for that next stage in terms of the city plan um, and, you know, more than a maximum height limit. Oh, Tēnā koutou, thank you for coming here and um, talking to us and answering our questions. We appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. Uh, now we have Catherine Mansfield, Birthplace Society. So we've got Cherry and um, Nicola. Uh, welcome. Thank you. So you have 10 minutes and there likely will be some questions. Right. Kia ora tātou. My name is Nicola Saker and I'm president of the Catherine Mansfield Birthplace Society and I chair its board. With me is Cherie Jacobson, who is our director. I'm going to speak for two and a half minutes, Cherie, for another two and a half and then we'll take questions. Uh, I think probably I'll start with the significance of Catherine Mansfield, who was born at 25 Tinakori Road in 1988. She is New Zealand's most internationally well-known author. She has influenced countless other authors um, in the past and in the current climate, and she also um, inspires creativity in others, whether the visual arts, the musical arts, or whatever. 
she left New Zealand in 1907 to live in London and didn't return to New Zealand um, except in her thoughts, which meant many of which are contained in letters, journals and her writings, particularly her Wellington stories, which Cherie is going to mention. Uh, she, what we try and do at Catherine Mansfield House is apart from having a unique experience the only Victorian house in Wellington that is open to the public seven days a week or six days a week, um, is also to support and encourage creativity in others. So the living legacy of Mansfield is her ability to inspire. Um, she was a modernist writer and she moved moved writing a long way away from the very long 19th century, which was basically a lot of which was taken up by windbags, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, her stories plunge you immediately into the centre of action and she used dramatic techniques to do that. The other thing about her is that she is unique to Wellington. Um, she didn't, apart from visiting Picton, and um, the Uruweras, interestingly, she didn't live anywhere else. Um, her reach isn't just that of a uh, kind of an old writer. Um, the lead singer of the Proclaimers, the Scottish rock band at, his con at the concert here last year, um, said to the audience as soon as he started, I got in a taxi to Catherine Mansfield House as soon as we landed in Wellington Airport and I hope you are proud of her. She's a creative genius. So that gives you some idea of how influential she is and how far her reach is. Um, we have attracted over 80,000 visitors to the house since we opened. We've attracted 3,000 this year and that's with COVID and closed down. And we are on set to becoming you know, our busiest time now. So we combine um, literary heritage with a physical built um, heritage environment, and it's also a commercial and tourist operation. So it is, combines a lot of things that are, I think, important to Wellington and which we appreciate the council's support for as it stands. Shereen. Kia ora koutou, my name's Cherie. Um, I just want to briefly talk about the significance of Thorndon and Catherine Mansfield. So her Wellington stories are some of her most famous. Some of them are set in Thorndon. And the Garden Party, for example, describes the historically mixed nature of Thorndon with both workers' cottages and grand houses. We recently offered guided walking tours of Catherine Mansfield's Thorndon as part of Wellington Heritage Week, and the tours booked out within days and received incredibly positive feedback. Part participants said it opened their eyes to parts of Thorndon they didn't know about and its history, including its pre-colonial history. So one key message we'd like to ensure councillors are aware of is that Thorndon suffered huge losses when the motorway was built in the 1960s. Two of Mansfield's other family homes in Wellington on Tinakori Road and Fitzherbert Terrace were demolished. And when we have school groups come to visit, we say, try to imagine the bird song and even the sound of the sea, which was much closer when the house was built in 1888 than it is today. However, it takes quite a lot of imagination as the house now has a disturbing backdrop of constant motorway noise right over the back fence making the back garden unusable for events and other activities. There are already several high-rise buildings in the immediate vicinity of 25 Tinakori Road, and we're concerned that the context of Catherine Mansfield House risks being further eroded by the draft spatial plan, specifically the rem proposed removal of protections for pre-1930s buildings, the proposed removal of character area status from a large section of Thorndon around Hobson Street, and the proposed ability for two to three storey terrace type housing to be built along Tinakori Road, including next to and around Catherine Mansfield House. Visitors often walk from the Botanic Gardens along Tinakori Road with its mix of small and large historic houses. And the context of Thorndon as an inner city heritage suburb adds to Catherine Mansfield House as a tourist attraction, which is unique in Wellington, offering an experience that combines literature, social history, colonial architecture and interiors. And I know some people don't feel that more colonial built heritage needs preserving, but if it's destroyed like pre-colonial built heritage was, 
we will have learned no lessons from the past and just as people today grieve the loss of pre-colonial built heritage, future generations will grieve losses inflicted during our lifetimes. As a Category 1 historic place, Catherine Mansfield House and Garden has been restored and cared for since the 1980s as a place of education and enjoyment for the benefit of all New Zealanders and our international guests. And its context in Thorndon is a vital part of its story and we hope that councillors will recognise this as they consider the next steps for the draft spatial plan. So we're now happy to take some questions or discuss anything. Are there any questions? Councillor Rush. We'll ask one. Um, so I guess the question that's been asked to others today is that um, we uh, have got a housing affordability problem and we are required as a council to provide for today's generation but also future generations. So what do you say to people that would argue that um, future generations will be able to make their own heritage and uh, the sorts of things that you were talking about um, will pass into history as, as other things have. Well, I think our built heritage is an integral part of our identity and our history. Um, and, you know, it's the very fabric of our city. And if we lose too much of it, then we risk not learning from the past. Um, that would be my key point. Got a question from Councillor Matthews. Yeah, it's actually connected because I mean, Catherine Mansfield herself was a bit of a socialist, and um, so <laughs> so I'm I'm wondering what you think that she would think in response to the housing crisis that we have now and the unaffordability of housing in Wellington. Well, I think she knew the value of um, warm, dry, good housing, um, having lived in a lot of terrible houses in the UK and searching for a warm climate to cure her tuberculosis. So she certainly knew about the effects bad housing can have on people. But I would just speak from our own experience at the house that, yes, we know the challenges of heritage buildings, but we've successfully installed heating and done maintenance and really worked to look after the built heritage. So I don't like to speak on behalf of Catherine Mansfield, quite hard to do, but... Um, I think she would recognise that, you know, you have to make some concessions to contemporary needs and requirements and people's health, but that it can be done while um, not losing what we've got um, in many places. Sorry, I've probably... Not at all, no, no. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Free. I think part of the point you were making was that there's an economic opportunity um, here as well. And um, do you see that that can be enhanced through some sensitive retention of the local environment. I think that was the point you were making. But how extensive would that have to be to create a, enough of a precinct that it would, because obviously you wouldn't be asking for everything, but. Well, we've quite specifically focused on Thorndon because obviously that's our context for the house. But also I think Thorndon's pretty unique in that it is an inner city heritage suburb. You know, people can walk from Lambton Quay, from some of those national attractions like Parliament, to Thorndon and see some of those incredible timber houses. So I think there's definitely an, op an economic opportunity there for making the most of Thorndon, given how close it is to the central I mean, city. I, I don't think Wellington makes enough of its history. Thorndon is the oldest suburb in the country. It is, it is the treasure house of the country. It has parliament, it has the National Library, archives. Old St Paul's. Old St Paul's. Us and, and other things. And I, I just, um, I do see it. I think the trick is to combine commerce with heritage. I mean, that's what we do. And um, I think it's perfectly realisable. I mean, you, I mean, God knows, if you want to talk about Mansfield, you only have to look at the Bloomsbury industry, of which she was a group in England, and every Bloomsbury site and the monetization of that rather random group of individuals um, is, is an extraordinarily successful industry. I mean, it's possible to do that here too. Well, kia ora kōroa. Thank you very much for coming in today. Um, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Lawrence Collingbourne from the Onslow Residents Association. So Lawrence, uh, you've got 10 minutes and there will likely be some questions. Thank you. I'll try and leave time for questions. 
Tenakoto Kiora, nice to meet you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Just to remind you that Onslow represents Broadmeadows, uh, Kandala, and Kai Fora Fora suburbs. Thank you. Um, we are strongly opposed to the draft spatial plan, and it's for the reason that it's simply not credible as it stands. Um, we believe that it would destroy the character, value, and amenity of our suburbs, but without gain to the much bigger issue uh, of addressing the current how and future over 30 years housing issues. Um, and we think it doesn't yet apply the NPSUD correctly. So um, let me uh, uh, start, though, by saying that we are acutely aware of the current housing crisis. Um, Unaffordable housing when you're young is something I experienced when I graduated. I couldn't buy a house for nearly 10 years. I have children, and we have children in Kandala that are looking to buy homes right now and are just shocked at the uh, recent price increases. So I'd like to address some of that. But in my backyard in Kandala has grown by more than 30% number in the last 20 years. We're not against appropriate identification, okay? We understand the pain uh, of affordable housing, as I've said, and we support the goals of a progressive and vibrant city we see in the, in the plan. It's just that we uh, don't see them, the plan as it stands delivering those, okay? So I'm only going to mention four reasons for time why the plan's not credible to us, and then I'd like to talk about what I feel is more realistic to help us with the big problem we face. Right, it's based on the false idea that there will be 80,000 more people in Wellington. This is not close to accurate because Forecast ID, Stats NZ, and the Ministry of Environment ask you to use the most likely number, which from those statistics is 45,000, not 80,000. But that's just the demand side, right? The plan doesn't calculate how many dwellings will be supplied by the new zoning. So we really don't know what it's going to deliver. But we do know one thing from the work that was done. There's plenty of growth available in Kandala without changing the district plan to more than achieve the forecast growth. Secondly, we believe it's based on a dream about what the uh, railway line could become. If it was possible to improve our 140-year-old railway line, it would have been done years ago, quite frankly, but instead it was bypassed in 1937. It is slow, infrequent, unexpandable, and often down for maintenance. So we can't justify this as a rapid transit corridor. But come on, it only goes to Wellington Station. By the time you get there to start the journey to where you really want to go, you could have arrived, but only by electric car, of course. But hey, in 10 years' time, all new cars are going to be electric. I feel it's based on a misunderstanding that one kind of vibrancy trumps all others. But that's not the case for us. We want you to understand that for us, Kandala is not a temporary transit stop on life's journey. It's our destination. It's our choice. It's our Taronga Waiwai. It's our Taonga. Kandala is amongst the, the pinnacle of Wellington's vi villages. Don't trash it, please. But the fourth reason, and perhaps the biggest fantasy of all, is the idea that seems to be built into the plan if you just change the rules. Allow developers, catalyst developers, I would call them here, loose to dump multi-story apartments randomly across our village. That somehow, that by magic, you will create affordable and resilient homes. Really? Just look at Oriental Parade apartments. They're the most expensive in town. Listen to the submitters who've told you they can't afford to rent brand new apartments in Wellington. They're too expensive. So let's get more positive. 
What's more realistic? Well, I suggest that if we get with the MPSUD requirement to build realistic capacity in three stages, five years, 10 years and beyond, they will be focusing more realistically. So let's stage the district plan accordingly so we can test as we go, right? Let's aim to build cheaper with cheaper land. Let's look for those brownfield sites that Kainga Ora has mandated to do. In quantity, not single sections, because we need to use factory production to reduce building costs and improve quality, right? I think we need to build where there's social license and where young people want to live close to the city. We've heard this morning we want to be able to walk to where they uh, socialize and work. Can I also draw your attention to the ele an elephant in the room? There's probably more than one. But um, it's, it's a qualifying matter, the MPSUD calls it, and it's this. All of Wellington is an earthquake zone. The, earth the fault lines are 25 kilometers deep. That means that all of Wellington City sits above them, right? Um, so just to strengthen 561 current multi-occupational buildings is going to cost an average of half a million dollars each. That authoritative source, the Don Post, tells us, right? So how much will housing thousands in high-rise apartments on our hills cost? See, Christchurch built lower, cheaper, resilient housing, Right, they got government money for their infrastructure, for their CBD refreshment. A lot of buyers had insurance payouts. Look, if we want to fix affordability, the government's got to flash the cash and pay for Wellington's COVID recovery, okay? Would that satiate investment demand, I ask myself? What do you think? Will the Reserve Bank lending money for free and no better long-term investments with equal tax status? I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge, eh? So I see this, that the only viable solution is a regional one. And that means the city's going to have to compete with the other cities. And to compete, we need to play to our strengths. And I put it to you that the character, value, and amenity of its suburbs is one of its differentiating factors. But the real key to success here is to work with your very capable residents, businesses, and communities to create the figure, not against them, right? Do it for them, not to them. Uh, recognize our differences, right? And manage the different agendas. I think there's room for all in Wellington. Okay, we can do this together or we could scar each other for life. But I better end there. Uh, I want to see a brighter future. I've got a couple of questions. Councillor Rush. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Lawrence. You, you touched on something that has been bothering me, I think. So I'll just ask you the question. Do you think the spatial plan is the wrong tool to fix the current housing crisis? Well, it, uh, because it doesn't focus on specific actions in the short term of where we're going to create this new housing, so long as it doesn't do that, it's the wrong tool. Should it do that? I would have thought a spatial plan should be targeting specific action on space. Uh, Councillor Condy, question. Kia ora, thank you. Um, you said that we should be building with a social license and that we should be building close to the city where young people want to live. But as you've heard, if you've been sitting here, that we don't actually have social license to build close to the city either. In fact, we're not, we don't have social license, if we hear from different parts of the city, to build anywhere. So what do you think, how, how do we resolve that, that tension that we're hearing from every suburb, that um, you, everyone supports affordable housing, but our place isn't quite the right spot? <laughs> That's a toughie if everybody's saying that. It does show, though, the level of opposition to the high-rise, high-density. However, I understood there were corridors that we could start with where there was more social license than other places. So that would be down Adelaide Road and, and places like that. Well, tēnā koe, Lawrence. Thank you for coming in and um, supporting with us today. Um, councillors, we're just going to have a two-minute stretch and break because we have been sitting for a while now. But, yeah, don't go far away. We'll...
Thank you very much for waiting for us to have a, qu a quick stretch. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming in. You've got five minutes and it does go thank very well. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak as a humble citizen of Kandala. Uh, someone contacted me the other day and said, uh, when I told them I was going to appear before the council uh, over their proposed spatial plan, they said, why bother? You'll be dead when uh, the effects of it are felt. And that is probably true. I will be a permanent resident out at Macra, uh, but I do worry uh, about the long-term effects of negligent decisions now, and of course Councillor Rush is dealing with the consequences of negligent decisions made by the Council 50 or so years ago that are being felt now. So you have a very heavy responsibility, water, in case you've forgotten, um, <laughs> oh, and I'm supposed to engage positively with you. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, can I begin by saying I was, uh, I am acutely aware of the issue of affordability of housing, and I'm still stunned by the fact that I used to own the smallest house in Wellington, which is 17 Selwyn Terrace, Thorndon. And I bought it in 1990 for what I thought was quite a lot of money, $130,000, flogged it off 15 years ago for $400,000, and the now Minister of Conservation, Kitty Allen, sold it toward the end of, the la of last year for $800,000, uh, and it is the smallest house in Wellington. I suggest you go on a site visit and look at it. Uh, it's been beautifully done up, thanks to me. But the fact of the matter is there are huge affordability issues that need to be addressed, but they won't be addressed ladies and gentlemen, by creating Stalinist Gothic monstrosities on Box Hill, Kandala. And so you need very carefully to think about the consequences of your actions. And I've made two points in my submission because I thoroughly endorse everything Lawrence said on behalf of the Onslow Residents Association. And the first point is that Wellington is changing as we speak and changing quite quickly. And when I was a law clerk in Brandon's 32 The Terrace in 1980, uh, I uh, used to walk along the terrace. It was the home to any number of head offices. The dairy board was here and so on. And now the terrace is reverting to what it was in the 1920s and 1930s, which is becoming a place where residences, especially apartments, are uh, more common, student hostels and so on. Uh, and so the, city, the city's commercial area is shrinking and we need to take that into account. And the second point is, and I endorse heartily what Lawrence has said, we really do need to take a regional view of things because, uh, as I was saying to Speaker Mallard the other day, I was on my way to Rotorua and looked down and saw the tremendous development in Parkway. Went out and had a look, some superb housing out there. Uh, but if we simply concentrate on inner city Wellington, which is one part of Wellington, it's not Wellington in, in toto, we will uh, possibly make mistakes that can be avoided by taking a regional view. The only other point I would make is uh, while I uh, have no expertise in the area of education. It does surprise me uh, that uh, some people are saying that the schools in Kandala are capable uh, of accommodating more students. That's simply wrong. Kandala school is pretty well full. St Benedict's, my old school, has nowhere to expand. And Kashmir Avenue School, uh, where I was famously the caretaker while at university, uh, has now expanded out onto the field where I used to play rugby as a kid, so there's no space there either. So uh, think long and hard about the consequences of your decisions. I'm not a nimbyist. I uh, do love Kandala. It is my Turanga Waiwai, uh, and I would hate to see uh, intergenerational botch-ups occur as a result of a spatial plan that's not properly thought through. And with those comments, I'm sure Councillor Young has a question for me. I, I've got a question <laughs> oh, you're for in you. Charge. Sorry. Um, are you aware, you just talked about the regional, um, you know, looking at it regionally, are you aware that yesterday we endorsed uh, um, going out to the community to consult about a region, regional growth um, framework? No, but that's a brilliant idea. Congratulations. So, so yeah, so your oh, no, thoughts no, I'm not are being to be critical. Addressed. I'm here to praise. As Councillor well. Fitzsimons. Look, I just since you said the word NIMBY and that you weren't a NIMBY, well, not a NIMBYist, can you tell us what you think a NIMBY is? 
Uh, well, uh, a NIMBY would simply say uh, uh, any development is fine so long as it's not in my street, Woodman Coat Road, uh, and I recognise that there needs to be intensification uh, and that some hard decisions need to be made. Uh, all I'm saying is when you make decisions, Councillor, bear in mind you're making them for future generations. Won't worry me, I'll be gone, uh, but uh, you will destroy uh, a suburban environment like Kandala. And that's not nimbyism, that is prophecy. And call me Jeremiah if you like. <laughs> Councillor Matthews. Just to, that, that sort of, um, you know, the joke about, well, I won't be around to see the changes. Um, almost, almost, well, you know, but you're lying. Um, it's almost universally from young people we are hearing basically the opposite of what you've said, which is densify, character doesn't, you know, it, character doesn't mean the same to me as it does to you. This plan is a, is, a, is a good balance between those things. And actually, I just want, you know, somewhere to live. So if I we are making... But I didn't say don't densify. I said densify sensibly, and there is a difference. Hmm. Cool. Well, thank you, Chris, thank for coming you. in and, and sharing with us. Appreciate you taking the time. I'd like to now welcome Fit Wellington, Sam Donald and John Rankin. Kia ora kōrua. Um, so you know how this works. Um, you've got... a. Uh, 10 minutes, and there will likely be questions. Thank you. Tēnā uh, John Rankin and Sam Donald, on behalf of Fit Wellington, for those who don't know, we're a, a group that started out primarily transport advocacy. We've renamed ourselves with transition in the title, still a transport focus. Um, but we realise that there are lots of other issues that um, we are thinking about and we want to talk about too. Um, so... In principle, we support a majority of the spatial plan as it's been presented. Um, I, I would say that collectively we feel there were better ways to engage with the community. It's quite a top-down decision-making traditional consultation process. Um, it was a great uh, talk that Councillor Panett and um, Mayor Foster attended uh, a couple of nights ago. Um, Joe Cribb made some great suggestions about co-design and collaborative um, decision-making and um, definitely could have led to less opposition, I think, in the community if it was a, a less traditional, this is what we want to do type presentation. Mm -hmm. Our main concern with how the spatial plan was presented is that there's a big part of it missing and it's very fundamental to how the city grows. It happens to be something that is um, underway at the moment, but it's completely a miss. Um, if we basically, where is the transport overlay? This is the spatial plan as it was presented to the community to comment on. If they want to look at the transport, maybe you can see some train stations there. Um, that's it. Um, so it jumps straight to the proposed growth um, with no ability for the community to kind of analyse how the city should be growing in relation to how it's going to move around. So we can go and have a look at Greater Wellington's transport maps. Um, even they don't talk about the future. You know, spatial plan is looking at 30 years growth. This is just present day bus routes, train lines, roads. Let's go Wellington moving. Obviously, business case is underway at the moment. So people who, you know, know this is happening can go at and look back at information presented a couple of years ago. So the um, rapid transit line from the railway station to Miramar and the airport um, with the darker pink being five minutes walk to a uh, mass transit uh, station and the lighter being 10 minutes. So this is the sort of identification of growth and density and intensification that the community should be commenting on when they're looking at a spatial plan and it's missing. Talk about living local. Okay. One of the things we've been thinking about is, is it's not just about housing, it's about living. 
And so our, the way we think about the city is how dense are the amenities that are accessible to me from where I live? Um, and there's been some interesting work coming out from overseas quite recently that talks about, not about housing density, but about amenity density, so that um, a, a city that I'm familiar with, um, which is Vancouver, uh, over 70% of the people living in Vancouver live in an amenity-dense neighborhood, which means that they can walk to a, sh to a grocery store, a pharmacy, a public transit stop. Um, there's a childcare facility, a primary school, and a library within one and a half kilometers. So everything that they, that they need to live is within their local community. And so when you look at a, at a map of Vancouver, you can see actually here are the places, and it's most of Vancouver, where I can live locally. So housing densification is great, but it's about amenity density as well. So, it, so it, 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 it's what's necessary versus what's sufficient. So that raised a question for us. What percentage of Wellington's current population lives in amenity-dense neighborhoods? Haven't been able to find that information. Maybe it exists. I don't know the answer to that question. Seems to us that a spatial plan should have some information that sheds light on that question. Could also be, with a 30-year plan, a useful metric to look at with short-term planning to see how things are progressing. The second aspect that we think about it is, is what we call transit-oriented communities, that where we live, we have choices about how we get around so that we're not restricted to, if you have a car, you can go anywhere, but if you don't have a car, you're actually really limited. So creating uh, um, an effective rapid transit network that's a mix of buses, trains, light rail, whatever, allows gives people the opportunity to live, work, and play locally and within their city and within the region. So that raised another question with us. What percentage of Wellington's population lives in transport-dense neighborhoods? We think the answer is probably close to zero because as the, best, the, the, the best example within Wellington City is, is the railway line from Kandala, and as, as our earlier, uh, your earlier presenter said, that's not a terribly effective rapid transit line. The, the folk that live up the coast and in, and in the Hutt Valley probably have better transport services than a lot of the people living in Wellington. One of the great things we think about the, the, the changes to the bus network is that we're starting to see real frequent services and real express services. So that's, that's great. So we think that another level of doing density well is having a, an healthy, healthy urban ecosystem. So not um, treating the, the urban landscape as a, a, a clean slate. Um, there's a lot of... Um, past um, natural resource that you know can be looked after, nurtured, and, and reinstated, and um, the spatial plan doesn't talk about that a lot either. So another, raise another question, what percentage of Wellington's population lives in ecologically dense neighbourhoods? And you know, similarly to the transport, I would say probably not many. Um, we'll just flick through these briefly because our submission was basically covered this. Um, it was just a one page. Hopefully people have had time to read it. Um, but just to hammer home those three points, transport density, housing density, um, which is about quality. It's not just about quantity. So we, we feel like we need other mechanisms like design review panels to ensure quality, ecological density. And I can just scroll that up a little bit. If you plan cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you plan cities for people and places, you get people and places. And I'll just also leave that, um, which we can email and there's a printed copy here. Um, so this is something we, again, would like to see um, the council implement at some stage um, and open for questions. We've got a question from Councillor Pennant. Thank you very much. And it's great. 
sorry, apologies. Um, sorry, so you're saying not through the centre, like along the Golden Mile, basically, that it's going to be too difficult? It needs to be rapid. It's not that it's difficult. I mean, it is difficult, but it needs to be rapid transit. We need to get from the railway station to the airport in about 20 minutes or people will still choose to drive. Not it's not that. about mass transit, it's about rapid transit. It needs to be frequent and fast. OK, and, you're, um, and you think that people want to live right along the route that, um, that you're supporting? Cities all over the world have proven this, yeah. And, and surveys, all the Let's Go Wellington moving surveys were strongly in support of it. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sparrow. Yes, thank you for that. Very um, interesting concepts there. Just one question, a quick question on the, the immensely dense. I saw the um, criteria, and I guess it's not your criteria, but I did have a question about people living one and a half kilometres from a library as part of that formula, if you like, and which would mean a whole lot more libraries with, throughout Wellington to be part of that, because, I mean, one and a half kilometres from school and a library, there are a whole lot more schools than there are libraries, so is that a fair... Would it be a bad thing if there were more libraries in the city? But to be realistic, it's probably not going to happen, is it? Well, if you live in Vancouver, as I said, over 70% of the people in Vancouver live within one and a half kilometres of a local branch library. We're they, not saying they it needs to be implemented now, but we're talking about a 30-year spatial Remember plan it, with bigger density. Yeah, yeah. It took Vancouver 25 years to get to where they are today. This doesn't happen overnight, but they have been thinking about and planning and working towards this for a long time, which is why so many people want to live there. Maybe schools and libraries could be partnering. Um, thank you. Kia ora korua. Thank you for coming in um, and sharing your whakaaro with us. We appreciate that. Uh, no mai Matthew Tucker. Uh, kia ora Matthew. So Matthew, uh, you've got five minutes. It goes really fast and there will likely be questions, but um, yeah, we'll see how we go. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Um, thank you for having me here today. I just, um, probably on the other side of the coin, and I've, I've heard, you know, a lot of people, I was at the other submission the other week, and really, you know, I've heard things like, oh, there's not going to be 80,000 people, the train line in Crofton Downs is insufficient, the um, don't ruin my neighbourhood, oh, Candela's the best little township in the world, you know, and I've been to Candela a number of times because I live in Crofton Downs, and actually there's no township in Crofton Downs. So, you know, I think as, if that's the best people can think that, Candela's going to be as a township. I wonder what the future holds because for me, I look at the people that are submitting and they're the people that have things. You know, I'm, I earn a good wage and I can't afford a house in Wellington. And in Crofton Downs, they've got the development there and they're building 300 whatever houses there and they're million dollar houses. That's not solving any problem. Million dollar houses aren't we having? We're not going to run out of million dollar houses. For me, I look at this plan and I think to myself, it needs to be a solution to the housing affordability problem. That's what I would see. I mean, I'm, I'm, there are other reasons that it's been put in there, but, you know, when I read it, I think to myself, you know, I, I deal, I work at um, the Student Association and I look at all the problems that students are having um, with affordability, you know, and, and I've heard things like, oh, back in the day, maybe it's a rite of passage to have a scummy house or something like that. But sure, when your house cost $60 a room and education was free and life was affordable, maybe you could, maybe that was okay. But when they want to charge $200 a room, that's not about affordability. You know, I think it's already at crisis now. And the people that have houses around the city that are coming here to say, you know, they're kind of implying that urban design hasn't changed and doesn't exist and suddenly communist designs are going to pop up all over the place. <laughs> you know, these big square concrete monoliths are going to show up in Kandala because I'm here to say I think and I agree that Johnsonville should have 18-storey apartment buildings and I say that based on the fact that if 18-storey apartments were allowed, then that would be built. If eight-storey apartment blocks were allowed to be built, it's going to take a long time for the market to determine that that's profitable. Today, it would be profitable for 18 stories to be built, and that would make a change. And I think in Johnsonville's case, you know what, people, is it so horrible to see a high-rise apartment? Is it going to look out your window and say, oh, that's the most, you know, that's ruined it? Because for me, it's about the people that don't have houses. And, you know, I don't know where their voice is, and I suspect they're not coming here. And that's the primary reason I showed up. I showed up to, you know, because of whatever, but um, because I think in not here the people that don't have houses, that don't have access to housing, and I, I can afford it. I'm, I'm well paid. 
but not, you know, I'm lucky. But so many people don't and have families and stuff like that. And I can give you an example. If there's a six-storey house up in um, Calburn, soon that's going to be a student house because they can charge it at six times $200 a week for students. And that's going to force all of those families out. And I don't know where they're supposed to go. You know, it's not these little no-bedroom apartments in town. You know, urban design needs to be about building livable spaces, you know, and I would hope that that would be part of this expansion. You know, I wrote a whole lot of other things here about that poor train line in Crofton Downs, which I've caught from time to time, and it's perfectly fine. You know, I don't know why people are hating on it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I would just say, you know, actually, when you, when you decide on this, you know, help the people that don't have, the people that haven't come here, the people, the voices that, you know, they don't even feel enfranchised to even come and have a conversation rather than the experts, the well-paid people that can't afford houses that don't want someone next to them interfering with their privacy in their backyard when someone can't even have a backyard. You know, like I, I think about Crofton Downs, if you said, oh, we're going to have a six, four-storey building there, someone would be like, what about my backyard? And I'd be like, you've got a great park just down the road. And that doesn't happen everywhere. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> oh, no, well, that was that. It was just, you know, notes. Oh. Have, have you got more to say? Or? No, it's just the same, same yeah. stuff. Kia ora. Um, <laughs> Councillor Rush. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Matthew. And I really appreciate that clarification around the Johnsonville line, actually. Um, I guess something I'm really struggling with is you mentioned the million dollar house and, and how that's unaffordable to, to most. Um, I'm guessing also, actually, that if for some uh, mechanism we could make those houses $800,000, they'd be unaffordable. In fact, if we took it right down to 600000 and so I'm struggling to, to understand, well, well how, how far, where, where is affordable? What, what makes affordable? I think, you know, that you, you can't solve it easily. There's not any, because it's never going to be $100,000 houses, but if we don't do anything, they're going to be more than a million dollars. That's the problem. I'm not saying, I'd rather $800,000 than have a discussion about a million dollar houses. Kia ora, Councillor Matthews. We've also heard from a lot of people about how, you know, living in an apartment is, you know, terrible. And, you know, I've had people come to me and say, how could you condemn someone to living a life in an apartment? What have you got, got to say to that? Well, when I, when I lived in, randomly in Portugal, you know, and some other, and in Spain, <laughs> those apartments weren't dinky little one bedroom. They're livable. You could have a family there. It'd be perfectly acceptable. You'd be like, that's a beautiful apartment. There's a beautiful kitchen. There's multiple rooms. It's well built. You know, you can't hear the neighbours doing whatever they're doing. You know, so it's great. Kia ora, Matthew. We've run out of time for more part time, but thank you so much for <laughs> speaking from a different perspective. Kia ora. Uh, now I'd like to welcome um, Jackson and Tim on behalf of the um, Wellington City Youth Council. <laughs> Oh, and we've got Tony as well. Kia ora, Tony. All gangs here. Kia ora. Thank you for taking the time to come. And I know it's a busy time of the year for students. Yeah, no worries. Fortunately, um, I'm in a privileged position where I can actually get time off work. Most young people aren't. Um, so ngā mihi nui ki te tumua ki tu arua, ngā mihi nui ki te kai whakahaere o te kōmiti nei e kai kaunehera dei, ngā mihi nui ki ngā kai kaunehera katoa me ngā kai mahi katoa o te kaunehera. Ko Jackson Lacey tokoi ngoa he me māhau o te rūnanga tai ohi o tō koutou kaunehera. Um, I'd like to wish, uh, acknowledge the Deputy Mayor, the Chair of the Committee, Councillor Day, as well as everyone, councillors and council officers here today. Um, I'm standing in for Laura Jackson, our Deputy Chair, who's unfortunately unable to be here. Um, I'd also like to make very clear that I do not have my um, Tawa Community Board hat on today while I spout um, unbridled urbanist propaganda. Um, uh, very quickly, Youth Council very strongly supports the draft spatial plan. We believe that the plan not only provides for the framework for the upward growth that Wellington desperately needs, but does so in a way that creates sustainable and youth-friendly urban communities. Our written submission provides detailed reasoning for our support of the various provisions of the draft plan, and we urge councillors to read it if they haven't already. It's only nine pages. Um, I'd just like to speak briefly to two of the more controversial issues within the plan, wherein we feel that a youth voice is particularly important. On the, on the matter of character and heritage, while Youth Council agrees that there is a need to preserve dwellings of high heritage value, we believe that the housing Wellington desperately needs should not come at the expense, should not, should not be limited by the value of some old houses. We note the important distinction between true heritage and mere character. 
and we remind councillors Totoko to um, Matt Tucker. We remind councillors that black mold is not a rite of passage; it is a health crisis. Um, on the matter of suburban intensification, we generally support the proposals within the draft plan for increased maximum building heights um, in the outer suburbs. We particularly welcome increased development in Johnsonville and Tawa, given their proximity to rail, and it was interesting to hear this morning um, the uh, comments from Stride. Given the existing lack of, int of urban intensification within these communities at the present time, we urge councillors to ensure that growth begins in the central city and then moves outward, while of course keeping within the requirements of the National Policy Statement on Urban Development. In conclusion, councillors, I'd like to leave you with one question to think about as you amend and vote on this plan. Ask yourselves, who do you care about more? Houses or people? Thank you all for your time, and I welcome your questions. Kia ora. <laughs> Councillor Pennant. Thank you very much. Um, that's really super helpful. Um, so two questions. I was just curious about your comments about making our suburbs suitable for people with uh, children and, and um, because they're going to become more urbanised. Would you accept that children can grow up in all sorts of environments and... And love living in cities too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, the proxy. I mean, just look at um, Clifton Terrace School, Mount Cook School, um, schools in in urban environments where children are, are, are thriving and loving it. Um, you can you can raise a family in an apartment building if the apartment building's designed and built correctly. We can absolutely have child and youth fat friendly um, urban spaces. We just need to plan for them. Great. Thanks for the clarification. And just quickly, where do you think? Um, most of the young people that you work with would like to live? Where would be the ideal place, apart from obviously being warm and dry, but location-wise? Wherever we can afford. But seriously, um, if you've got proper urban, if you've got proper mass transit, obviously the central city is the preference because it's closer to everything, but if you've got proper mass transit, if you've got, um, as the uh, speakers from Fit Wellington were saying, if you've got proper, frequent, fast ma mass rapid transit, you can really live anywhere. Tim, did you have... Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously most young people at that stage in life where they want to live in town, close to work, close to friends' activities, but, um, you know, young people aren't like a homogenous group. There are, I'm sure, lots of young people who want to live out in the suburbs and want to have all these other good things as well, and affordability is part of it. Kia ora, Deputy Mayor Free. Yes, I was kind of interested in what you said about young people and having a good life in a city. Um, where do you think the trade-off comes between things like green space and, um, you know, public community space and extra housing. Just interested in your thoughts. I think you can have both, because if it's a, if it's a matter of land use, then we've already relatively reached, we've reached the limits at which we can build out, that's clear. Um, but I think there's a lot of unexplored potential um, for the integration of green spaces into high-rise urban developments. Um, but green spaces, public green spaces, are already um, are already really valuable parts of apartment living. My, um, I've just recently moved into town, shock horror, um, and my backyard is Teodoro Park. Um, and it's uh, that's my green space. That's where I can spend time um, out in the environment. So if you ha and <laughs> it's nice, but it could be nicer. And if you have well-designed green spaces that are linked in to apartment living, then absolutely, you can you can do great things. Mm. Uh, do we oh. have enough right now in the city green space? Uh, probably do with some more. I would imagine if you know. The, the housing mix changes, right? We get more apartments into the future, mm. obviously, that people won't have a private back garden, perhaps, as they may have done growing up. So I think it would be really important to maybe increase that if we yeah. could, or at least protect whatever we have now, because that will become often people's only access to green space. And obviously we know that has a wealth of benefits and all that sort of stuff, so definitely one on. And I think it's very important that those um, public green spaces be preserved for the public. If it's council land, then it's then, then it's public use. Um, because if you've got green spaces that are integrated into private developments, um, then only those residents get use of them, and it's really a community amenity um, that could be widely used. Uh, here, Patai, uh, Councillor O'Neill. Um, kia ora. Thanks, team. Um, my question is 
directed to maybe the students, if any of you are, are still studying at the moment. Um, we know that uh, young people say you're earning, um, you've got a minimum wage, 20 hours a week job, um, and you're studying full time. What can that buy you in terms of Wellington's housing market, or what's your been what's been your experiences of trying to find a flat? Yeah, so I mean, obviously it's, it's pretty rough um, for the second year students especially because they don't have a rental history. So a lot of people really struggle with just getting into the market in the start. And then so generally, from what I've sort of seen recently, in town you're paying about between 200 for like no windows is kind of like the go-to. Yeah. 250 for something with windows and a double bed is sort of the upper end of the spectrum. Um, if you're like in the young professional space, it's sort of like 260. Um, and then you move out to the suburbs a little bit, but you're not getting much under 200 hundred currently it's basically the experience I know of most people um, to be able to, to be able to live in you know a relatively small apartment in town sharing with someone else I have to work 15 20 hours a week and be elected to the tower community board and still take out a student loan uh, from councillor Calvert um, thank you. Um, and yeah, we're seeing horrendous um, rents and house prices at the moment. And obviously, the spatial plan. You know, by the time we get through the process of several years of hearings, it will, as it turns into the district plan, it's going to be a wee way down the the, the track. So, uh, from your perspective, uh, is there anything the council or um, should be doing now? Um, to start helping alleviate the problem because we need something done within the next five months, five years, as opposed to, um, you know, longer. We've got to have that view, but I just wonder whether you've got some thoughts on that, whether it's a council or government. I mean, certainly the council, I think, could do more work with places like the universities um, to increase the housing supply there. I think there's a lot of, you know, places that they could, you know, student halls, they could have second years in them. There's a case with Victoria University that they could really open up a lot of space there. They have a lot of spare capacity at the moment. I know that's a fact. And so there's just sort of a whole lot of small things could probably make a bit of a difference. And, you know, even things like abandoned houses. You know, I live on Hatayto Road. There are three houses which are currently untenanted, not up for sale, and you know, I'm not quite sure the legal ramifications or the arrangement there, yeah. but I mean, if the council could somehow incentivise people to at least tenant them, perhaps that could be a step in the right direction. I also very firmly put on my not youth council hat for this one, but um, I think we need to look very seriously at rent ceilings. I think we need to look very seriously at controlling rents in the city um, because they're simply getting out of control. We need to look at rent ceilings. We need to look at property management. Um, without libeling anyone, I think we've got a lot of problems with property management in the city. Um, with young people suffering um, from the consequences of, of unfair property management, um, and I mean, you look on you look on Vic deals this morning. Um, I think it was eight hundred dollars a week for a four bed, essentially. I mean, no insulation, no windows. I've been in that place; it was horrible, um, and that's not that's not that's the fault of the market, and it's the fault of the marketer. Um, we need to seriously be looking at prioritising people over profit. Well, Tina Koto, thank you so much for taking the time to come in and kuru with us and um, representing Youth Council. We appreciate that. Nga koutou. All right, we are now up to Karen um, Lakshman. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So you've got five minutes, and there may be some questions in that time. Uh, namaste and good afternoon. I see my colleague Christopher Finlayson spoke earlier, and uh, he's, he probably said everything that is opposite to what I propose to say. Um, but listening to the uh, previous two presentations, um, I will start with this statement that I'm fundamentally at odds with the proposition upon which these uh, discussions are predicated, which is that it is the responsibility of ratepayers through this council uh, to solve the housing problem. Um, prior to this year, we already had an existential crisis. We referred to it as the climate change crisis. As of this year, we have a second existential crisis, and that's the virus. Um, it is time for us as a city, 
indeed as a nation, to pause and take stock of where we are, the inherent difficulties we face, and where we wish to go, and how we should proceed. Uh, to me, that is mere common sense. Um, by the sounds of it, uh, that, that's not a view that uh, many people around this table share, if any at all. Um, I, I, I think that all this discussion um, uh, that, that we are having is fundamentally flawed. Uh, yes, we have a housing problem, we have a crisis, but that is one for central government to solve, not, not for individual councils. Um, um, the, the students and the young people who spoke um, uh, face problems here, but uh, they are here, if they're here as students, they're, then they're part of the education system. That is a responsibility of central government, not of local government. Uh, it's the responsibility of the universities which are funded by central government. Um, there are other young people here who simply uh, come to, to, to Wellington or indeed go to Auckland or some other urban areas just because they prefer the life there. Um, I met a young, young man in his early 20s who's living in an apartment downtown paying $400 a week. Um, I asked him where he came from. He said Palmerston North, where his family lives. I asked him why he came to Wellington. He said because he was bored with Palmerston North. Now, is it my responsibility as a taxpayer to, to uh, pay rates uh, to accommodate him? The short answer is no. Uh, that is my fundamental presentation. I, I presume you've read the online submission I made. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Councillor Rush, thanks. Thanks. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's the first time I've heard that particular point, and it's an interesting one. Um, Rate payers are not responsible for, for housing. Okay, I get that. Um, but as a city council, I see our role is to free up rules to allow developers and others to invest, and uh, which does not cost the rate payer. Do, do you agree with that as a, a, a role? No. Developers are there to make money for themselves. I don't uh, for a moment accept any developer who says that he's doing it for altruistic purposes. It's purely for selfish purposes. Councillor Matthews. What is in the council remit is zoning. And, you know, that's what this plan we're looking at. And the, you know, the previous settings have led to more big houses being built further out of the city. Uh, and we have an undersupply of smaller dwellings. So do you not support us taking action to enable the kind of uh, spaces that more of our people need and that the, that the current settings are, are not delivering? Well, uh, you have to define our people first. Uh, and may I say, since you raised this point, that um, the spatial plan is a policy issue. Uh, it's, um, it, th this is the council's plan, and it follows on from the policy statement that the previous government through the then minister Phil Twyford made uh, with all due respect to him, he's, he's, he's an incompetent person. Um, uh, he's not a minister. We have a new government. And I said in my online submission uh, that um, um, that would be another reason why we should pause. Um, the RMA, the Resource Management Act, is going to be repealed and replaced. Uh, and we should wait for all of that before we um, proceed. We can have a discussion, but I urge you not to make any decisions that are binding mm -hmm. until we know what the lay of the land is statutorily. Um, uh, in the next three years. Can I just check, are you sort of saying that renters and people that can't afford to buy homes aren't our people? No, I'm saying our people are our citizens and, 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 and the, the people who traditionally live in the city, not people who come here because they want to enjoy the nightlife in Courtney Place and then put pressure uh, on, on us as a city. Kia ora, Karen. Thank you for um, coming in today. Um, we have run out of time now for more questions. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, now, councillors, we just have to adjourn the meeting because we have um, a meeting next Tuesday just to finish um, the rest of the submissions. So um, I uh, move that we adjourn the meeting to 10.45 a.m. on Tuesday, the 1st of Decem December. <laughs> I had to read that twice. <laughs> it is December next week um, at the council chambers um, here. So can I have a seconder for that, please? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Free, and we will vote on that.
and that's unanimous. So um, we will now finish the meeting now. Itu iti karakia mutunga. Unu here, unu here, unu here, kite uru tapu nui. Kia watia, kia mama, tingako, te tinana, te wairua, ite ara takatu. Koya ra e rungu, whakaia ake ki runga. Kia watia, kia watia, ai rā, kua watia. Kia ora. I was just going to say to um, councillors, when we say that karakia, if you're wanting to um, acknowledge